Last year, more than 13,000 companies offered 900 number services for such things as stock quotes, legal advice, horoscope information, and sports scores. A number of companies are charged with abusing the 900 number service, charging for information that could be obtained free of charge elsewhere, or simply promising services and never providing them. In this hearing, members hear from representatives of several consumer groups and telephone services. Good morning. Today the subcommittee will hold a legislative hearing on H.R. 328, the Telephone Consumer Assistance Act introduced by Representative Bart Gordon. I commend Mr. Gordon for his efforts <clears throat> and look forward to continuing to work closely with him as the committee moves legislation to deal with a growing number of complaints surrounding interstate audio tech services, more commonly known as 900 numbers. The 900 services industry is fast growing and evolving. It is expanding exponentially, both in types of service offerings and in gross revenue. In the relatively short period of time since their inception, 900 services have become a familiar element in our daily lives. Used by some of America's most respected business institutions to provide a plethora of useful and innovative applications. For example, they are employed to do everything from sample public opinion and raising money for charities to providing financial news or sports information. Because 900 services are so easily accessed through the use of the telephone, <clears throat> the industry has the potential to become an important tool in bringing the benefits of the information age to almost every home in America empowering individuals with information or entertaining them with games. There are unfortunately many problems in this nascent segment of the information industry because, as is often the case in any expanding new industry, problems emerge that are unique to the nature of that industry. <clears throat> the very fact that unscrupulous or fraudulent 900 providers are able to cheat consumers by utilizing the billing and collection services <coughs> me, of our national network of local friendly telephone companies should indicate that guidelines in this area are needed to protect consumers beyond existing consumer protection laws. As a bottom line, consumers should be no worse off after the introduction of a new technology or service than they were before the introduction. Right now, many consumers are enticed to call 900 numbers through advertising that is misleading or outright deceitful. This is especially true for young children, the most easily deceived consumers, who have unwittingly run up hundreds of dollars in charges in their parents' phone bills after being induced to call the Easter Bunny or Popeye by marketing pitches children simply are not old enough to resist. The following tape is auto-dialed 900 services solicitation that illustrates the problem. We'll be investigating the company that made this recorder. <laughs> Uh, later on this month, and uh, we hope before we end this opening statement, we'll uh, we're going to cut back to our studios now. For uh, although uh, the uh, tape pitch may not be patently illegal, since it fleetingly mentions the price and does not quite uh, guarantee a Hawaiian vacation, uh, we can all understand how it could easily induce an innocent consumer to respond. Such practices, although conducted by a minority 
have the net effect of undermining consumer confidence in legitimate programs and their sponsors and ultimately discourage the use and expansion of 900 services. Clear, constructive guidelines established uniformly will go a long way in restoring consumer confidence in the industry and in burnishing the tarnished image of honest, legitimate providers of 900 services who are adversely affected by pay-per-calls renegade providers. The FCC <clears throat> needs to have the proper regulatory tools at its disposal and other law enforcement entities as well to combat the high-tech hucksters of today. All too often, the Federal Trade Commission, the U.S. Postal Service, and local law enforcement can only act after the fact, after a consumer has already been defrauded, and after the unscrupulous provider has already skipped town. Many of the renegade providers are fly-by-night operators and, like the voice services they offer, seemingly travel at the speed of light. These scam artists can pack up and leave with their profits faster than the forces of good can catch up with them. For this reason, it is imperative that the FCC use its common carrier jurisdiction to establish preventative measures to protect the consumers. <clears throat> we don't want to have to chase crooks after the crime, but to preempt pre them from com committing their crimes in the first place. Only the FCC can implement preemptive measures. Last November, Congressman Ronaldo and I wrote to the FCC and requested that the Commission begin to examine the nature of abuses in the industry and provide the subcommittee with recommendations for legislative remedies. In January, the Commission informed us that in the near future they plan to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking for the Interstate 900 industry. I applaud the Commission's efforts to address the problems faced by consumers and look forward to working with the FCC as we move forward on this issue. In the final analysis, our job as public policymakers is to ensure that 900 services can be used without fear by all Americans, from Main Street to Wall Street. As we map out policy in this area, our goal should be to make 900 numbers safe for the Fortune 500, not for some swindler to make fortunes from $500 telephone bills to unsuspecting consumers. Although today's hearing will deal with H.R. 328 and the 900 industry in general, I am working closely with my subcommittee colleagues to address legislatively a number of related consumer issues. These issues include intrusive, unsolicited calls from telemarketers, automatic dialing machines and junk faxes, as well as some uses of automatic number identification by the 800 and 900 number industry and caller ID, all of which may compromise personal privacy. The brave new world of new technologies and services in our telecommunications market must exist to empower and enhance the lives of individuals. The riches and benefits of our national telecommunications network are evident everywhere. Our objective in looking at the 900 number industry is to harness the value and richness of its offerings and to curb its excesses. We will, in essence, need a brave new world order to bring and guide our steps and safeguard the rights and privacies of individuals in the information age as we craft public policy in this area. So that concludes the opening statement of the chair. Um, I would note um, that uh, Matt Rinaldo, the ranking uh, minority member, uh, is um, right now over in an important meeting uh, dealing with the interests of the state of New Jersey. Uh, and uh, he, he called me to tell me that he is still delayed in trying to resolve the uh, issue affirmatively uh, for the state of New Jersey, and uh, he will be here presently upon the completion of his task. So at this time, we will recognize uh, from the state of California, Carlos Moorhead, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity to review the status and progress of 900 telephone services. I also appreciate the presence of the members of our three panels who are willing to and able to share with us their time and expertise. I would like to offer a special welcome to Mr. Jim Harold, a member of the third panel. Jim is director of 900 Services for Pacific Bell in my home state of California. He will provide the committee with an overview of the regulations governing 900 numbers and other audio tech services in California and Nevada. California's regulations are designed to benefit not only the consumer, 
but also the vast majority of information service providers who operate ethical businesses and who are tarnished by the actions of a few. I believe that the regulations which have been established in California can be used as a guide to this committee because they are sound rules which are acceptable to 900 service providers. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay throughout the, the meeting this morning because I'm on the energy subcommittee that's going to have Admiral Watkins <coughs> appearing before it, reviewing the national energy strategy. But I'll look forward to reviewing today's testimony at a later date. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing, and thanks also for the hearing on this subject last year. I'd like to thank and welcome our colleague from Tennessee, Bart Gordon, who more than any other member of the House or Senate, or more than any other American, so far as I'm aware, has spearheaded this important consumer issue. There has been way too much fraud and abuse in the delivery of this service. You have singled it out in, in a very telling and important way, and I think that your work is a great contribution to the consumer movement, so I appreciate your work on this. Some in the audience might hope that this issue is going to go away with your hard work and this committee's uh, following up on it. This issue will not go away. I think that we will not rest our labors until consumers are protected. So thank you, Bart, for your tremendous contribution to this area. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bliley. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. I don't have a long statement, but I do want to thank you for holding this hearing on H.R. 328. As you know, this is an issue that I have been interested in for some time. During our discussions on dial porn in the 99th Congress, I expressed concern that dial porn was only a part of a broader emerging problem in the area of dial -it services. And I suggested that we deal with the issue by requiring either credit card access or subscription <coughs> for these type services. This approach was supported by some decency groups, the ACLU and others. However, it met stiff opposition from the industry and many phone companies. I would suggest that had we proceeded along that course, we would not need this hearing today, but that is water under the bridge. It is clear that action is now required. Only a system of equal uniform and national regulation will allow the industry to grow while affording consumers adequate protection under the law. I hope this subcommittee will act promptly to ensure that consumers continue to have access to honest information providers and that the industry continues to grow and involve <coughs> and fulfill its bright promise. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for scheduling the hearing. I would also like to salute the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Gordon, uh, for his efforts to address this problem and hope we can all work with him to confront this issue in a meaningful way. Thank you. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for your leadership uh, in, uh, in protecting consumers, part of a long tradition that uh, you've had. And I also want to uh, salute uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, who I think has done a terrific uh, job uh, with this uh, issue, and I look forward to uh, working uh, with him. During the short period of time that I was away from uh, this subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, due to the vagaries of uh, committee uh, bidding, my small business subcommittee uh, has been inquiring into this issue as well. And uh, as a result of our investigation, I think that it is time also to focus on the role of the four inner exchange carriers, MCI, Telesphere, AT&T, and Sprint, who are providing virtually all of the 900 services. A new memo that's just been done for me by the Postal Service indicates that these four large uh, inter-exchange companies are doing virtually nothing to deter 900 number fraud. And in many respects, these companies are more interested in protecting their 900 number profits than protecting the consumer from ripoffs. And I would just like to cite briefly a case that was given me by the uh, Postal uh, Service, Mr. Uh, uh, K.M. Hurst. He cites the case of a fraud investigation involving a free vacation sweepstakes offering called the DISC sweepstakes. <coughs> Before a judge issued his injunction in this case, the sweepstakes collected $940,000. The judge ordered all of the money returned to the consumer. But MCI, which provided the telephone link and was holding the cash, 
didn't read the judge's order the same way. The inter-exchange company, which assumed no liability for the fraudulent customer, took its cut of the take, $165,000, before the ill-gotten gain could be redistributed. The phone company called it actual costs for use of the lines. To me, it's a little bit like in an armed robbery where they return the wallet but make the consumer have to pay for the gun. The Postal Service also says that these long-distance carriers are not effectively screening 900 promotions. They permit obviously fraudulent ones to use their facilities. Even after they're put on notice that a scheme has run afoul of the consumer protection laws, these long-distance companies have permitted virtually identical schemes to use their facilities. The Postal Service also states that the carriers typically fail to help the consumer seeking redress. They simply pass the buck to the promoter. Consumers don't uh, know which carrier provides a particular 900 number service until they receive their phone bill. And the Postal Service notes that no federal agency regulates the billing and collection function of the carriers because the FCC has determined administratively that its jurisdiction extends <coughs> only to the tariff functions of providing long distance service. I would only say in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that this role of the four inner exchange carriers in uh, these 900 frauds is an aspect of this debate that needs a great deal more scrutiny than it's gotten. And I would hope that, a that at a minimum, as this committee processes legislation, that the committee would direct the FCC to require these inner exchange carriers to have billing and collection procedures that protect the victims of fraud rather than, in effect, uh, allow their lines to uh, be used to perpetrate these frauds and pretend that they have no responsibility whatever to the consumer. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. McMillan. I have no <coughs> statement uh, to thank you for the hearing and to congratulate my colleague for his uh, diligent work on this issue, a very important issue. Great. Are there any other members seeking recognition at this time for the purpose of making an opening statement? The Chair does not see any other members. Um, and uh, the Chair, in order to demonstrate the subcommittee's complete command over uh, the technologies under its jurisdiction, will make one additional attempt uh, to, uh, to uh, give you a sample uh, 900 number that is of some concern to us. We remind you that all of these, all of these statements are being monitored by the Iraqi government, and uh, we will try to get back to uh, Peter, um, no, Arnett uh, after uh, the next commercial. So uh, we we. Uh, <coughs> We, uh, <laughs> the war is over, isn't it? Uh, I, I thought we had those airways freed up. So we'll, um, uh, we'll turn to our, uh, our special guest today, uh, uh, the Honorable Bart Gordon, who has been working uh, long and hard on this issue. And we thank you for your help and your leadership. And whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My batteries are charged this morning, so I, I will go forward. I want to Thank you and the, uh, the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify before you. Uh, and I also want to thank my colleague from Tennessee and all the members for their generous uh, comments. And Mr. Chairman, I particularly want to thank you uh, and your staff for the courtesies and assistance that you've shown in, in helping me to develop this bill. Mr. Chairman, in less than a decade, the 900 industry has grown into a billion dollar business. For hundreds of honest, hardworking, and creative entrepreneurs, 900 numbers can make a business dream come true because startup costs are low. The best of the 900 industry offers American consumers unmatched convenience, from recipes to tips on using computer software. Many 900 services are giving callers just what is advertised, a good deal. But virtually unencumbered by any rules, 900 numbers have also become a haven for tricksters, scam artists, and high-tech hustlers. To stem the tide of growing suspicion toward the industry, consumers must be protected on the front end. Consumers should be told what they're getting 
and how much it's going to cost so they can make intelligent, informed decisions. I believe that's a common sense approach. And that's why I've introduced H.R. 328 in Congress. Over the past six months, all involved in the audio text business have worked hard to improve this promising industry. The FTC has filed important lawsuits. The Postal Service has taken its own enforcement action. The FCC, at your suggestion, Mr. Chairman, is at last considering rulemaking. All these steps are positive. All should be applauded as first steps. Normally, the states can regulate telephone-related business. Yet, in the case of 900 numbers, almost all are interstate, putting them outside the reach of most state regulators. State officials understand the problem, but in many ways find their hands tied. And that's why we need federal action, and we need it now. The consequences of an unsavory reputation will be disastrous for the 900 industry. One state is already seriously considering what is known as universal blocking of 900 numbers, making access to 900 numbers available only if the people ask for it. Universal blocking was the death of local 976 business, and it could kill the 900 numbers as well. Today, you may hear that all the 900 business needs are new self-imposed guidelines, but that's just not true. Unenforceable industry standards by themselves just don't work. Let me give some examples of what has happened, standards or no standards. An editorial in the Cincinnati Post shows that a family can be bankrupted by 900 numbers. The editorial describes how a 15-year-old ran up $40,500 in 900 charges on his parents' phone bill in just over a month. The calls were all to a sex-oriented number that his parents would never have permitted him to call, yet he spent $40,500 before they knew it. <coughs> It costs $6 to call the 900 number advertised on this postcard. But all you get is an application for a so-called secured credit card. Even though you see Visa and MasterCharge displayed prominently, this has nothing to do with either one of those. The terms of the offer are outrageous. After paying $76 in fees and phone charges, the consumer can get a secured credit card with a $500 limit. But only after depositing $500 in the bank offering the card, and on top of that, this bank has the nerve to charge 19% interest on all the purchases while paying no interest on the deposit. And most importantly, the consumers get none of the information before making the phone call. And won't ads are also becoming a common way of 900 advertising. My hometown newspaper ran this ad for hospital jobs. The ad offers jobs starting at $6.80 an hour in your area with no expense, uh, experience necessary. When we called the advertised 900 number, we discovered that there was not one job offered in Tennessee or anywhere else, only a series of general job descriptions and possible salary ranges. The, telef the Telephone Consumer Act will set up a comprehensive system of checks and balances in the 900 business so that telephone bill payers know what they're getting and what they're getting themselves into when they dial a 900 number. H.R. 328 will give the Federal Communications Commission authority to oversee the industry, and it will provide state regulators with vital information concerning 900 services. The bill requires common carriers to give phone users a chance, free of charge, to block access from their telephone to 900 services. The bill requires advertising to state clearly, both verbally and in print, the charges, the billing process, and the fact that children are restricted from calling. The bill requires arrangements with the local exchange carriers to stop disconnection of telephone service because of non-payment non -payment of 900 charges. And the bill requires that common carriers give each telephone user the one-time option to void 900 charges caused by unauthorized use or misunderstanding. And maybe most importantly, the bill requires an introductory message that describes the service offered and its cost, and that allows the caller to hang up without charge at the end of that message. You may have some witnesses here today who, who will say that the introductory message will kill this industry, but let me assure you this is not the case. What honest in enterprise will be afraid of letting a consumer know exactly what he or she is getting? The 900 industry isn't going to go away, 
It's not going to be legislated away, but the industry does need to be cleaned up and it needs to be cleaned up now. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your time and the committee's time this morning. Great. Um, we thank you very much, Bart, for your um, contribution, and we're going to be working very closely uh, with you. Uh, any members that uh, might have any uh, questions that they might want to ask? Congressman Wyden. Mr. Chairman, and uh, again, Bart, you've done an excellent uh, uh, job. I, I found uh, very alarming this uh, memo from the Postal Service with respect to the role of the <coughs> four uh, long-distance carriers who were perpetrating uh, the bulk of, uh, who were allowing the, the perpetration of the bulk of the 900 fraud. Is it your desire to have the FCC specifically uh, uh, required that uh, these uh, long-distance carriers, the inner exchange carriers, have billing and collection procedures that protect the consumer? Unquestionably, Mr. Wyden, that is the, uh, the heart of this legislation. Uh, there will be others today <coughs> that will tell you that you don't need <coughs> legislation. The FTC has the authority. The Post Office has the authority. But what happens is they come in after the horse is out of the barn. Uh, they're <coughs> dealing with literally thousands of, uh, of information providers, uh, thousands of potential calls of abuse. It would take an army of bureaucrats to track it down at this end. What we need to do is go to the narrow road uh, in the path, and that's at, the, at, that's at first. There are only four common carriers, but dealing with those four common carriers is much easier than trying to be after the fact with an army of bureaucrats trying to chase down uh, these culprits. Now, the Federal Trade Commission has filed two lawsuits, and I think the Post Office has maybe issued a, a lawsuit or two. But that simply is, is not going to get the job done. Well, I, I appreciate that, Bart, and I think that some of the opponents of, uh, of your <coughs> legislation in trying to clean this up have suggested that your bill just was going to target the promoters, and uh, I appreciate uh, knowing that uh, you want to go after the inter-exchange carriers uh, as well that uh, are involved in this. And I would only ask, Mr. Chairman, unanimous consent that that uh, memo from the Postal Service investigators could be put into the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. Gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the concerns that I have that um, it would be helpful if you would address for a second is the where a lot of times calls are made by computer to the answering machines, answering services <coughs> or pages or whatever, and you pick that up and you call back and you're billed for it. Clearly, the introductory message will deal with that, but are, are there any further prohibitions on that? The legislation. And as far as using uh, automatic dialers. And well, you might use automatic dialers to dial banks yeah. of numbers, either answering yeah, services or, or pagers or whatever, where you get the message unknowingly, uh, not knowing who is calling. You call back and you get billed for it, basically. Well, I think that can be avoided in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, the introductory message would, when you called back, would let you know there'd be a call. Um, uh, we would require the telephone companies to, to bill separately the 900 charges so it would give you the opportunity to go ahead and pay your phone bill and contest the 900 charges. Uh, I had a hearing in Tennessee the other day and someone uh, brought to the attention that uh, they had had some, some billings and they expected that it was probably, or the phone company thought it was from a mobile phone that somehow had gotten on the same uh, frequency or whatever and had been dialing 900 numbers. Um, and also, we would provide a, uh, a one-time uh, forgiveness in situations where there was a misunderstanding or an un unauthorized use. Mm -hmm. uh, the point that I'm raising is that although those are great consumer protections, does it go far enough in dealing with the basic ethical behavior of someone who's going to call a bunch of, you know, a phone bank mm -hmm. to get either a a list of answering services or whatever so that they can leave this message. Well, I think uh, that goes to a question that the chairman has been addressing, and that's a privacy mm -hmm. uh, question. And uh, um, I think my, my main concern in this legislation is to make sure that the consumer knows what they're getting into and they can make a choice. If the consumer re couldn't stop that call from being made into their, their, their um, mm -hmm. phone system, but they, once they called back, uh, they would know there was 900 charge and, and could hang up without being charged. Thank you. Are there any other members uh, seeking recognition? A uh, gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. I'd just like to add my name as a co-sponsor to the legislation, and I would urge my subcommittee colleagues to do likewise. Thank you. Any other members at this time? Let me ask you, uh, 
uh, Bart, if I, uh, <coughs> if I could. Uh, many in the industry argue that this is a violation of First Amendment uh, rights and an, uh, an unwanted and uh, improper intrusion of the government into an area of free enterprise and uh, uh, free expression that uh, really is not uh, justified by historical precedent. How do you answer that? Well, I think it's probably unwanted by some of the, uh, the hucklers and scam artists, but I think it's going to be good legislation for the good users of this industry because the 900 industry is based on, on trust and confidence. Uh, and if the public feels that, that they can't trust the 900 numbers, that they're being, it's, it's just a bunch of scam artists, uh, then I think uh, people are going to be less likely to use it. As far as the First Amendment, aspect of this. There is no way whatsoever and no aspect of this uh, that in any way regulates uh, the content. Uh, it simply lets the consumer know uh, what the service is and what it's going to cost so the consumer then can make an informed decision. Well, let me ask you this. Many people would argue that this whole area constitutes nothing more nor less than just poor judgment on the part of consumers and that they have a responsibility. Yeah. Uh, to uh, inform themselves and that as a result uh, we cross a very sensitive line into an area where the government is over-regulating. Um, how do you answer that and where would you draw the line and what is the test that you would have us use in drafting legislation uh, as we move into this area to uh, regulate uh, private sector activities? Well, first of all, I would contend that many of the um users of the service are not informed. As I presented here at the last testimony, and I've, I've sent most of the members of the committee a tape which illustrates many of the ads that are on TV and elsewhere, and if you'll watch those carefully, you'll find that you don't find any uh, mention of what the charges are. Uh, and if they are uh, mentioned, they're very remote. So I don't think the consumers always know what they're getting into because of some of the advertising. Secondly, this is a un uh, an unusual business, and this is a business of impulse. If you go into a store and make a purchase, you've got to at least get into your back pocket, pull out some cash, put out a, or pull out a credit card. Uh, not the case with 900 numbers. Uh, if, if you, you know, once they get you with an advertisement, uh, it's, a, it's an impulse, you dial it, bam, it's on your phone bill. And so once again, all we're trying to do is inform the consumer and let that consumer make a, a choice. And certainly I cannot see how any valid business person uh, could complain with a consumer knowing what they're getting into. Okay. Bart, I thank you very much, and the subcommittee thanks you. We want to work uh, closely with you. And I know as you're leaving, you're wondering why we were not able to actually put out a, a 900 number. And just so you know, <laughs> it's clear for the record, uh, this machine was not made in America, uh, <laughs> although I can tell you uh -huh. that uh, uh, it was made in a recognizable and very well-known Asian country. And, <laughs> and uh, we will uh, just leave it at that. So we thank you, Bart. We want to work closely with you. And thank you, Mr. We're going to move on to the next panel. Thank you. So uh, the next panel consists of Mr. Erwin uh, Popowski, uh, who is here from, <clears throat> from as the Office of uh, a Consumer Advocate from the Commonwealth of, Mass of um, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Ken, Ken uh, McEldowney, Executive Director of the Consumer Action of California. Uh, Ms. Joselle Albrock, Assistant Attorney General of the Consumer Protection Division here from Dallas, uh, Texas. Mr. John Barker, a Senior Associate from the National Consumer League. And Dr. Lawrence Goldberg, uh, Consumer here from Alex Alexandria, Virginia. Welcome. I'm, I'm so, why don't we, uh, at this point, before we begin the, um, the second uh, panel's uh, testimony, uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to ask unanimous consent to insert my statement in the record, my opening statement. Without objection, the gentleman's statement will be inserted in the record at the proper point. <coughs> So let's turn to the panel, and we'll uh, begin with you, Dr. Goldberg, if we could. Um, and I would request each of you to try to draw the microphone up uh, a little bit closer to um, yourselves so that uh, 
all of your comments will be fully audible. Whenever you feel comfortable, Doctor, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to provide testimony to the subcommittee to voice my objections to 900 number telephone calls which have recently invaded my household. I believe my own recent experience will provide an example of the potentially serious financial dangers of such unregulated service to households with minor children. During the summer of 1989 and again in 1990, one of my children ran up charges of over $1,000 on 900 number lines for gab and true confession material through Telesphere Media 4, MCI, and AT&T carriers without knowing the true proportions of the cost being incurred. When the first telephone bill reached my house, I was shocked and outraged with my children. I called the local CNP company to seek help, and after several hours of calls and transfers to various offices, I was finally directed to Mr. Philip Johnson, an assistant manager of their business office. He was quite sympathetic and very familiar with this problem. He offered to remove the charges from my billings, but he pointed out that there was really not at that time an effective way to provide a block on such objectionable services. Several months later, I received in the mail a credit dunning notice from credit converters representing Telesphere Media 4. Only when I contested vigorously by letter, in which I stated my intention to write to the FCC and the Virginia State Corporation Commission, did they then remove their credit dunning charges against me. I believe that the Congress has a major public issue of growing national concern to contend with. There are many households with minor children throughout the country who already are at the financial mercy of purveyors of these so-called services. It is not just the potential pornographic content of these calls which is of concern, but more significantly, it is the potential for incurring truly substantial and uncontrolled costs that could damage a family's financial situation. I was fortunate in being able to contest the charges, but I am sure that there are many unsuspecting families with children, often alone at home, who will have no recourse but to pay. I understand that the Virginia Legislature has recently passed legislation on 900 number services that would provide some protection by requiring that charges be clearly disclosed. These measures only let the buyer beware. However, since the buyer is often a child, they are not, in my opinion, adequate protection for the consumer. I strongly believe that the consumer should be protected and that the onus of responsibility must be placed upon the purveyor of these 900 number services. I suggest as one approach that the purveyor be required to receive approval in writing from the individual for such services and offer an access code before they can be provided. This seems to me the only effective way to protect households with children against such abuses. It is not enough to have the consumer request a block of such services from the local telephone company and then pay a necessary fee, since in most cases the severe financial damage will already have occurred by the time he or she first becomes aware. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to express my concerns on such an important consumer issue. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg, very much. Uh, next, Ms. Albrecht. Mr. Chairman. Could you move the microphone up a little bit closer, please? Okay, is that good? Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm here today on behalf of Attorney General Dan Morales for the state of Texas. Uh, Attorney General Morales wishes me to express his regret he can't be here due to his schedule as a new office holder. He's, he's tied up. Um, I'm very pleased to be here in his stead in support and to express our support for H.R. 328. I'd first like to explain to you the history of our state's involvement in investigations regarding 900 numbers to make a few comments about the industry and then to make a few comments about the bill in conclusion. Um, the State Attorney General's Office of Texas has been very active in investigating 900 numbers uh, and we'd like to assure the uh, subcommittee that they are being used unscrupulously and in a manner which defrauds consumers regularly. 
Uh, we have in our office, the Dallas office alone, 183 uh, consumer complaints regarding 900 numbers that we've received in the last year. It's not an exaggeration to say that the 900 industry has the potential to become the greatest medium for consumer fraud to date. Uh, we undertook an investigation of 900 numbers uh, in the summer of 1990, and we coordinated and initiated a multi-state investigation, uh, which started in the fall of 90, with the states of California, Florida, Kansas, Missouri, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Wisconsin, and Washington. As part of that investigation, we've met with the four major uh, common carriers that offer 900 service. We have conferred with the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission, and we held a public forum on 900 services in Dallas late last year. Uh, the information gathered pursuant to our investigation uh, leads our office to conclude that the primary reason that 900 numbers are so attractive to unscrupulous marketers is that common carriers provide transmission, billing, and collection services with very few questions asked. Uh, the services provided by the carriers on 900 lines make them an easy and inexpensive means of making large profits while providing little or nothing to consumers in return. Uh, some 900 programs cost in excess of $50 per call, and all the marketer provides for that $50 is a tape recorded advertisement for his services. Marketer does not have to have a product to sell because the charge is incurred the minute the number is dialed. After that, who cares? The telephone company will collect the charges. It's possible for thousands of calls to be made to a 900 number in a day. In theory, an unscrupulous marketer doesn't have to be in business long to make fantastic profits. Nothing is more attractive to a con artist than a quick, lucrative hit. To make matters worse, the identities of 900 marketers are shielded by the carrier's billing and collection practices. Charges for 900 calls are billed in the long distance portion of the monthly telephone bill under a slip which is headed by the common carrier's name. The marketer's name does not appear on the bill. 900 marketers are thus imbued in the public eye with the power and authority of the telecommunications companies. That includes, in many consumers' minds, the power to disconnect basic telephone service. Consumer misperception and confusion about 900 numbers has dovetailed nicely into deceptive marketers' misleading and dishonest advertising schemes, which are designed to take advantage of the unwary or the uninitiated. The common carriers are the common link in the 900 chain of deceit, and it is appropriate to require that standards be set for their provision of services to 900 marketers. And that is precisely what this bill seeks to do. We strongly support virtually all of the provisions of the bill, but none more strongly than the requirement that a preamble appear on all 900 calls. Uh, just as uh, if you go to a department store, you'll see the price on the goods that you're about to buy. So should a 900 call have a price tag as well as a label? And on the price tag should be the total cost of the call and also the terms and conditions of the offer. Of course, clear and conspicuous price disclosures in advertisements are extremely important. Many advertisements for 900 numbers do not disclose the cost of the call nor the terms and conditions of the offer. Many of the advertisements include misrepresentations regarding guaranteed credit and free prizes. Some of the oldest marketing scams in the book have incorporated a 900 angle to the promotion. For instance, prize notifications that mask an underlying sales solicitation now include the opportunity to call a 900 number to find out what prize you will get. As always, the prize is just a coupon, which enables you to buy useless junk at inflated prices, but this time you've also paid the marketer to get that happy news. I affectionately refer to these ploys as wraparound cons. If they don't get you to buy the goods, they may still get you to make the call. A review of advertising for price and term disclosure should be conducted before the 900 service is put online, and that task should most logically fall to the carriers. They're at the source. Uh, those aspects of the bill which deal with billing and collection remedies are good. We have two points that, that we feel should be considered. Uh, a one-time adjustment is not enough. Um, I myself have been a victim to the same marketing ploy more than once. I would assume everyone in this room has uh, dialed an incorrect number. 
uh, or been disconnected from a call or got a garbled recording. There are many instances that uh, require adjustment more than on one-time basis. Uh, in addition, uh, there should never be a charge for blocking access to, to the 900 service. Um, our office in the state of Texas has, has advocated and continues to advocate that these numbers should be subscribed to. Uh, it's a service that, that shouldn't be hoisted off on consumers unless they actively wish for it. But regardless whether it's subscribed or, or a blocking option is available, uh, it's clear that no one should have to pay to reject a service. Um, we also suggest that the activity of deceptive marketers should be tracked by the common carriers. The common carriers should compile a report of complaints and activity on complaints that should be filed with the FCC and that should be made public. Uh, in conclusion, we would like to support the bill very strongly and say that in addition we would suggest funding for the FCC as well as sanctions <coughs> and penalties be, be uh, addressed in the bill and that no provision of the bill should be allowed to preempt state rights. We now move on to Mr. Erwin Popowski. Uh, welcome, sir. If you could identify yourself and Thank deliver you. your testimony. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Markey and members of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, my name is Erwin Popowski. I'm the uh, consumer advocate of Pennsylvania, and I'm speaking today on behalf of uh, the Pennsylvania Office of Consumer Advocate as well as the National Association of State Utility Consumer Advocates, or NASUCA. Uh, my office and NASUCA support H.R. 328 as an important step in bringing the 900 number industry under some form of reasonable regulatory control. Uh, as you have already heard and as you will no doubt hear from the uh, representatives of the audio text industry here today, there are many valuable services that can be provided by 900 number information service providers. There are also many competent adult consumers who understand the charges that are incurred when they dial 1-900 and who willingly pay those charges in return for the services rendered. Unfortunately, however, there are also an apparently endless stream of less scrupulous individuals and companies who have made the telephone into the weapon of choice for consumer fraud and who are turning the 900 number into a device to be avoided and feared. You've already heard several 900 number horror stories in your prior hearing on this issue, including several that have been investigated by my office and by the Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General, Ernest Preate. One gentleman called our office when he opened his August 1989 telephone bill and discovered $6,700 in telephone charges resulting from his 17-year-old son's compulsive use of 900 number gab lines. Before he received that bill, his son had already incurred an additional $3,800 in charges which appeared on his September bill. The disabled adult son of another Pennsylvania couple incurred nearly $8,000 in bills through participation in a television quiz program that he thought he had won on numerous occasions, uh, but he never seemed to receive any of the prizes. Um, our office only learned of that case, by the way, when we were notified by the finance company where the couple had, uh, had gone to, get, uh, to try to get a second mortgage on their home in order to pay their telephone bill. Now, America has always had its uh, confidence men and snake oil salesmen, but I submit that there are a number of factors which make a substantial portion of the 900 number industry particularly insidious and qualitatively different from other consumer scam artists. First of all, with a 900 number, you don't have to buy anything. The call itself <coughs> is the scam. Once you have spent 10 minutes on the telephone to figure out what someone is trying to sell you, you've already bought it. Second, the 900 number providers often prey on the most vulnerable members of our society, unemployed or low-income persons who desperately want information about jobs or credit, lonely people seeking companionship, and of course children who do not understand the cost of a 20-minute chat on a 900 number line. Third, and most significant from our perspective as advocates for public utility consumers, virtually all 900 number charges are passed on to consumers 
as part of their monthly regulated telephone bill. Most people believe that if they don't pay their entire telephone bill, they will lose their telephone service. It is this extra element of implicit coercion that enables the 900 number provider to successfully charge for services that no one would otherwise willingly pay for. In light of those concerns, Nasuka submits that the protections contained in H.R. 328 are essential to the welfare of American consumers. Finally, we are pleased that the bill recognizes the pot potential threat to privacy that is imposed on callers through the unauthorized transmission of their calling numbers to 900 number service providers. We believe that the vast majority of callers have no idea that their telephone numbers are being transmitted automatically to 900 number service providers. We also believe that many people would block the transmission of their numbers if they could do so and might even refrain from making certain calls if they knew that their number was being transmitted involuntarily. From our experience in various caller ID cases, Nasuka members know that a telephone number can be readily matched with a name and address through the use of a reverse telephone directory. We also know that lists of callers can be a valuable resource to commercial interests. Indeed, the provision in Section 4 of the bill, which forbids common carriers from providing a service where children are asked to provide their name, address, and telephone number, could become a nullity. With the use of automatic number identification and a reverse telephone directory, most of that information is easily obtained by the 900 provider without asking the child anything. For these reasons, we support the provision in the bill which requires the Secretary of Commerce to report back to, this, back to the Congress regarding potential abuses of automatic number identification by 900 service providers, and we would urge prompt congressional action to the extent that that report identifies any uh, abuses that can be cured by Congress. In conclusion, the Pennsylvania Office of Consumer Advocate and NASUCA support the provisions of H.R. 328, and we stand ready to assist the members of this committee in your further deliberations on this important issue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barker, welcome. Thank you, Congressman Wyden. The National Consumers League appreciates the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to present its views on the current state of the audio text industry and H.R. 328 sponsored by Representative Gordon. We have submitted a written statement outlining the National Consumer League's views on 900 numbers and the Gordon Bill. We thank the subcommittee for agreeing to hold early hearings on this legislation. We support the Gordon Bill and hope you will agree that with some modification, this legislation will establish a sensible regulatory environment which recognizes consumer concerns and interests without placing undue hardship on the audio text industry. The National Consumers League believes that the current state of the audio text industry presents a classic case for government regulation. This is due to the nature and size of the market targeted for 900 number services and failure of the industry to establish meaningful and comprehensive monitoring of services offered by information providers and service bureaus. It appears that the huge profit potential and low overhead costs of 900 number programs have resulted in a what me worry attitude when ethical considerations arise involving program content and fee schedules. The 900 number system originated in 1980 as a low fee service to measure public opinion. It has since grown into a highly profitable marketing device for information, entertainment, programs, advice, and news. You all may remember the age of free information, free, take one, and complimentary copy. Today it's call 900. What used to be given away as a public service is now being sold to the consumer. The 900 number system does provide useful services and programs. The National Consumers League does not condemn the system or chastise the industry for exercising a bit of entrepreneurial zeal in marketing the services. But we are dealing with what has been and should remain a specialized market targeted at a relatively sophisticated audience. The telecommunications and information industries, however, are creating a mass market of 900 number programs and services. Little attention is being paid to problems which result from rapid deployment of new technology on a mass market which is not sophisticated in the uses of that technology or prepared for the onslaught of this type of mass communication and mass telemarketing. 
The market targeted by the audio text industry is not made up of people who routinely fax or have call waiting and call forwarding or who deal in high-speed satellite data transmission. It is a mass market of technically unsophisticated consumers who really do not understand what is happening to them when they dial these numbers. Many programs are directed at preteens and children, at low-income groups which are in need of credit repair and jobs, people who jump at the idea of free trips because they can never afford one. Failure to provide disclosure messages at the beginning of audio text messages. Careful concealment of names, addresses, and business telephone numbers of information providers. Programs which are targeted at children imply that their favorite rock stars are only a phone call away. The linkage of a mass marketing device to the monthly telephone statement. Possible disruption of service for non-payment. A constant battle for low-income people to whom the phone is a lifeline, not an instrument of the information age. These are just some of the problems which have resulted from mass marketing of 900 number programs and services. And no one wants to take responsibility for policing the industry or resolving problems with the system. There are many components to the 900 number system. The local telephone company, the long distance carrier, the service bureau, the information provider, and television stations, newspapers, and magazines which carry ads for these programs. Local telephone companies only act as agents to collect charges imposed by the long-distance carrier. The long-distance carriers argue that their role as common carriers prohibits them from denying service to anyone who requests it. Service bureaus claim that it is the information provider's responsibility to make sure they are operating legally and ethically. And the information providers, well, it's very hard to find them. Those who publish or broadcast the advertisements for 900 number services simply look the other way. On the other hand, Everyone in this chain takes a percentage. The only one who does not profit from the 900 system is the consumer. And the result is that the telephone is fast becoming a slot machine, with the odds heavily in favor of the House. We believe, Mr. Chairman, that H.R. 328 accomplishes many of the objectives of prudent regulation of this new industry. It requires disclosure messages at the beginning of programs. It offers the consumer the opportunity to identify and locate information providers. It prohibits disconnection of service for non-payment of 900 number charges. And it imposes some controls on programs directed to children. We believe that parental consent warnings are probably ineffective in curtailing unauthorized use of 900 number services by children and that industry should discontinue targeting this market altogether. We thank you, Congressman Wyden, for giving the National Consumers League an opportunity to appear before this subcommittee. And we urge speedy and positive action on legislation to regulate the audio text industry. We, we thank you, and your testimony is very helpful. Mr. McEldown. Yes. Uh, Congressman Wyden and other members of the subcommittee, I apologize for being late today. I took the red eye from San Francisco last night. And let's always say several hours late getting into Dulles. Um, but I do appreciate... Or, or congressmen do that from time to time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today and strong support of Representative Gordon's Telephone Consumer Assistance Act. Nothing that has taken place since we testified last September has changed the pressing need for this bill. Consumer Action is a 20-year-old San Francisco-based nonprofit consumer education and advocacy organization that specializes in telecommunications and banking. We are particularly concerned about the impact of deregulation in these industries on low and moderate income families and limited English-speaking consumers. Consumer Action has pioneered in providing educational materials on banking and telephone issues for low-income consumers. Currently, we're distributing more than 100,000 fact sheets a month in English, Spanish, Chinese, Cambodian, Laotian, Vietnamese, and Korean through some 700 community organizations. The individuals, agencies, and communities we serve all tell us that, 800, that 900 numbers are a serious and growing problem in low-income communities. The problem is most severe in the Spanish-speaking community. For example, scam ads in Spanish newspapers promote calls for 900 numbers to obtain high-paying hotel and sewing at home jobs. For more than three years, Consumer Action has pressed for strong consumer safeguards for users of 900 numbers. Such safeguards have been won for consumers to call Pacific Bell's California 900 numbers. Even stronger safeguards have been recommended by California PUC Administrative Law Judge for AT&T, MCI, Sprint, and Telesphere as they seek to in offer intrastate numbers in California. Unfortunately, such safeguards do not protect consumers in other states or even California residents who call interstate 900 numbers provided by interexchange carriers. 
We believe that such protection can only come from passage of Congressional Bill H.R. 328. I anticipate that long distance carriers and representatives of 900 trade associations will testify today that the progress they have made in the last five months in establishing voluntary safeguards precludes the need for Congress to act at the present time. We disagree. The nature of 900 services prevents voluntary standards from having much value. The 900 caller has no way of knowing whether the 900 number called is covered by voluntary safeguards. A consumer has been satisfied with the protections connected with certain 900 numbers could easily be lulled into thinking that he or she would have those safeguards on other 900 numbers as well. Such a mistake would be costly. The value of voluntary safeguard was put to a test last fall in a California PUC proceeding to consider applications by four long distance carriers seeking to provide 900 service in California. The intention of the long distance carriers was to get the Commission to soften its restrictions and acknowledge that their business ethics policies and standards would not tolerate the type of 900 abuses that everyone is concerned about. So the administrative law judge gave the companies a test. Taking some 900 numbers that consumer action accused of deceptive practices, the judge asked each of the, provi each of the providers to give information on these potentially problem 900 lines. The ALJ asked for transcripts or tapes, advertising, catalogs or brochures, and whether each program was still in operation. The ALJ gave them the chance to prove that substantial consumer safeguards were not needed and they blew it. They failed to provide much of the information requested, they failed to show that they knew what it meant to enforce consumer protections, and they failed to show a willingness to cooperate with government agencies to investigate, monitor and enforce laws. The ALJ's verdict was as follows. Given applicants' failure to follow directions under the scrutiny of a public forum, we have little confidence in their capacity to respond meaningfully to individual consumer complaints. Unfortunately, applicants have failed to demonstrate on this record that they are capable of exercising good business sense and integrity in the provision of 900 services. Voluntary safeguards are not the answer, neither is the divided federal jurisdiction. We applaud the work of the FTC and the Postal Service, but their enforcement is too few and too slow. Last year, we, we released our dirty dozen. Today, I provide you with a tenuous ten. Uh, these are numbers that are promoted by postcards and newspaper inserts, virtually identical to programs that the FTC and Postal Inspector has already taken action on, but these still exist in the marketplace. Some of the claims, congratulations, you are, gradu you are a guaranteed winner, guaranteed visa credit card, official gift notice, national sweeps award notice. Existing law enforcement efforts are not protecting consumers. The local consumer action supports H.R. 328, but we would urge the following amendments. Price caps should be set for all 900 programs. The local phone bill was never intended to be used to provide billing services for high-priced consumer products and services. A consumer should be notified the first time that 900 charges reach a certain level. The IP should have proof of a contract with a specific charity before the 900 program goes online. The advertising provision needs some clarification. The IP must be required to disclose the total cost that will be incurred by the consumer for services being promoted. In conclusion, we are extremely pleased that, co that Congress is considering H.R. 328 at the present time. Abuses by 900 information providers are widespread throughout the industry. At this time last fall, our major concern was television advertisements for guaranteed credit cards. While this is still an issue, other problems that I have mentioned today in terms of the tenuous 10 have now sprung up. Heavy advertising in Spanish language press, saturation mailings of postcards and newspaper inserts. We are very concerned with the direction that 900 scams are taking. By using a lower profile method to reach their target audience, they reduce the chance that they will be discovered before they are able to extract money from their victims. Adoption of H.R. 328 with our suggested changes will both protect consumers and protect the industry itself from 900 consumer abuses that will prevent 900 technology from achieving its potential. 
we stand willing to work with the committee and also with the 900 industry itself in getting proper safeguards to that into law. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all, and, uh, and that's very helpful. I'll have some questions in a moment, but let me recognize uh, first my colleague uh, from Texas, Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel and particularly welcome uh, Ms. Albrock to fellow Texan and apparently a fellow Dallasite. <laughs> Appreciate your testimony this morning. I'd like to direct my first question uh, to you. Uh, the, as I understand these calls, when you make one, uh, you're billed by your telephone company. Uh, what I'm curious about is if you don't pay, does the telephone company have to pay the 900 operator anyway? No, not my understanding. The, I think the arrangement is, I mean, it, they could probably tell you better. The arrangement is, is that the common carrier contracts with the local telephone company to provide the billing and collection, and they do it. They do a discount for uncollectibles, so they have they have they build that in. They build uncollectibles into to the arrangement, the billing collection system. So if I um, if my kid runs up a thousand dollar bill, calling these nine hundred numbers, and my phone bill is fifty dollars, if I just mail in fifty dollars, will they will my phone remain installed in my house, or will they? tell me if I don't pay the thousand they're going to come get the phone. I think it varies from state to state uh, and it probably varies from local carrier to local carrier. Southwestern Bell to my knowledge will not disconnect for non-payment of, of uh, uh, 900 services. Uh, they will of course uh, not shield you in any way from the collection efforts that might be undertaken by the common carrier or by the provider themselves. Uh, is, it, is this is, her, is the experience that she's just described the same in your states? Does anyone know of it being in, uh, in uh, California? It's pretty much the same, but there are some billing problems in terms of Pacific Bell, in which when they submit a shutoff notice to a consumer, they lump together the 900 charges with the regulated charges. And if it can, unless a consumer is pretty savvy, and unless he happens to talk to a service rep that understands the situation. Uh, a consumer could lose service for non-payment of 900 bills. And we worked on issues like that, even though it's not supposed to happen. Uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, the uh, Public Utility Commission has uh, directed uh, that the local exchange telephone companies may not discontinue service for failure to pay a 900 uh, number charge. However, uh, there's certainly nothing on the bill itself that would uh, give the uh, consumer that information. Uh, so that if a customer yeah. is not aware of that pro if, is not aware of that protection, uh, they may not uh, be able to take the, get the benefit of it. It occurs to me that one route to dealing with this would be to uh, rewrite the collection laws of the state of each individual state in such a way that it makes it more difficult to prove the liability of the calling number for the amount that uh, they are dunning uh, the, the caller for. I'm not sure what evidence is necessary in a collection case now to collect on a $1,000 bill run up by a child in a, on a telephone. Uh, I assume that a child can't not, cannot go down to the local uh, hardware store and buy a riding lawnmower on credit and, and have the hardware store be able to collect that debt. I don't, th I don't think you can do that in our state. So why would you be able to do it with regard to a telephone call? I don't know that anyone has pursued a collection case to the courts on 900 uh, that, well, that I'm aware. Um, I'm sure some of the providers here might be able to give you some more information on that. But it would be our position that the only, the only individual authorized to run up charges uh, on a telephone would be the subscriber. And the subscriber would probably the, be the adult in the household, and the defense would be that that was an unauthorized charge and the child didn't have the ability to contract. Uh, I'm supportive of, of this type of legislation. I am curious, though, about the issue of uh, one's freedom to be irresponsible. It's hard to develop a lot of sympathy for a 74-year-old person who runs up a $34,000 phone bill, which is one of the examples I saw in reading through the materials here earlier. Uh, if it's a child, that's one thing. But if it's a grown-up, uh, it seems to me to, that, that uh, our only real responsibility as a government is to make sure they know ahead of time what they're doing and they're not being fooled in any way. But it's hard to believe somebody could run up six, seven, eight thousand dollars, thirty-four thousand dollars without understanding it that these repeated phone calls are going to cost them a lot of money. 
I think there are a couple of issues there. We worked on a case in California in which um, an elder, elderly woman um, had an adult son who was living in her household. And the adult called up Pacific Bell, um, and as our understanding is, had blocking removed from the phone. Um, and was making the calls without the woman's knowledge. One of the things I think you have to realize in terms of some of these calls, particularly in this case, this was a $13,000 bill that was run up in about four or five weeks. There was another case that we were dealing with in Southern California where it was a security guard who was using the company's phones after hours and ran up a, a bill even larger than that also within a month. So it's it's. A lot of it has to do with whether, whether or not it was unauthorized use. And also, I think it's a, some of the industry is preying upon people who are not um, emotionally or mentally uh, completely stable. And I think that gets into another entirely different issue. Well, in your state, would uh, the phone company, the 900 provider, have the right to collect that bill from that lady whose son did it rather than her? What, we, what, end, what ended up happening was that the service was turned back on. Um, the charges, the, the 900 charges, were um, wiped from her bill. Um, it was a complicated thing. She ended up having to pay um, $1,000 in long distance charges, which were used to con connect outside of the 900 bill um, to Robin in Los Angeles. Um, but it took both legal aid and consumer action to get the service turned back on and to get the charges worked up. We were to work with Pacific Bell to doing it. Okay. But another consumer who wasn't that aggressive uh, would not have had the same opportunity. Uh, it seems to me that um, there's some significant similarities here between the, one of the oldest forms of consumer fraud of all, and that's uh, mail scams. There's an old story in Texas about the advertisement years ago, surefire way to kill bull weevils and you send your money and what you get back are two blocks of wood and they say put the bull weevil between the blocks of wood and slam the blocks of wood together. I'm not sure what the difference is in many ways uh, between uh, uh, an advertisement that says you have won a gift, call 1-900 so and so and we'll send you your free gift. That's a fraud case, isn't it? Is that, that's not a communications law matter. Well, I, our position on this is that, yes, it is a fraud case. But one of the things that really concerned me as I was preparing for the testimony today was that even though the examples that I brought um, are operating right now in the marketplace, they are identical to the frauds that had been shut down by the postal inspector and shut, by, shut down by the FTC. There are so many of them. It is so sh easy to get online and collecting money that the problem is that the existing divided federal authority is not sufficient to really crack down on it. We think it has to get, the attention has to be at the billing collection level, which is what the bill addresses, because that's where you can nip it in the bug, where the, pl where the plug can be pulled from the IP before they're able to get the money and run. Just one last question. What is the cost of, what's the startup cost on a 900 operation, aside from the advertising, which would, of course, depend on your what you wanted to do, but just to go down there and get the right to to have a 900 operation at the phone company? You can, probably some people from the next panel could uh, help you on that even better than those of us here can. It varies tremendously. Um, we have had some scams in which people are being solicited to rent 900 numbers for as little as like $50 a month. Um, also, there are <clears throat> there's a player in, in, the, in the chain that's called a service bureau. An information provider in testimony that we got in Dallas can go to a service bureau, and the service bureau may be a you know, more well-established uh, money organization than, than this individual, and they might upfront all the costs and just take you know, part of the proceeds from the initial calls to pay for, for their services, so maybe nothing. Thank you. Thank uh, my, my colleague uh, from Texas. Just a couple of uh, questions. Uh, you know, my sense is in uh, fast-growing areas of, of consumer fraud, uh, very often that there are many instances where consumers are, are ripped off uh, and uh, they don't comment uh, or object. Do any of you have any estimates that would indicate that the number of fraudulent 900 services uh, that are going unreported is significant? And if you have any such uh, estimates, could you uh, share that with uh, the subcommittee? Mr. Barker. 
Uh, Congressman, um, the, you mentioned a case of disk sweepstakes, which was one of uh, three cases brought by the U.S. Postal Inspection Service in Des Moines, Iowa. In a second and similar case, the uh, postal authorities were able to get court approval to seize approximately 1.7 million in uh, fees, which had been collected over a six-week period by a sweepstakes company operating out of Atlanta, Georgia. And the calls involved in this sweepstakes cost the consumer approximately $9.95 apiece. And by my, uh, I'm not a mathematician, but by my reckoning, we are dealing with approximately 150,000 consumers uh, who were taken in a sweepstakes within a six, in one sweepstakes in a, one six week period. So I think this gives you uh, an idea of the, of the volume of fraudulent calls. I think it also gives you an idea of the tremendous profit potential in this industry. Mr. Popowski, uh, have you all done some research that uh, would indicate that uh, the number of fraudulent uh, 900 uh, uh, services is, if anything, underreported at present? Well, it's certainly underreported. We don't have uh, statistics, but only anecdotal information, such as the case which I mentioned, where uh, the only way we found out about it was when the uh, was when the couple actually applied to get a uh, a loan from the finance company to pay their telephone bill. Uh, w we know that the we suspect that we're talking about the tip of the iceberg in the, in the people who know enough to read their telephone bill, understand the charges, and know who to call to, uh, to be relieved. Yeah. Let me ask uh, a question about the, the nature of how we put this, uh, this bill together. I think Congressman Gordon has done an excellent job. When you look at the bill, it's very clear in terms of upfront services. Uh, informing uh, the consumer, complaint reporting, uh, that sort of thing. And I think that that's uh, extremely important because it's of a preventive uh, kind of nature. What the post office is concerned about and what I'm concerned about is to make sure that we have the cleanup tools, that we have the enforcement uh, tools, for example, to get the refunds to the consumers, to uh, make the refunds uh, to the victims. Would you all like to see the bill strengthened in that regard to make sure that there is clear statutory authority to the FCC to adopt billing and collection uh, procedures that would require these refunds and reimbursement uh, of victims, Ms. Albrecht? Um, yes, Congressman Wyden. Um, one of the difficulties that the state of Texas has experienced uh, in, in the enforcement cases that we've undertaken is how to get the money back. Uh, at currently, a major carrier is holding about $500,000 worth of uh, funds that, that we would like to see refunded to consumers in a case. Uh, and it's difficult because uh, the question of who should, who should bear that burden is, has to be litigated. If it were a matter of uh, regulatory uh, authority, then, then, then that would clear the question up. And obviously, the holder uh, being the common carrier at this point, I think, is, is the appropriate uh, organization with funding from the pro provider. I guess there are two things I'd like to add to that. One is that there is, right now, heavy competition among the long distance companies uh, for the 900 information provider. And one of the areas of competition is how fast they get the money to the information provider. And I think it's very serious in terms of the refund issue because there are now in the industry ways either in direct payments or in advances in terms of like a loan where information providers can be getting money within 30 days or so, or so uh, which is far too little time in terms of being able to get refunds back to consumers. Um, so I think that with that, we face a real problem in terms of the money not being there to refund to consumers. Two, I think that there also needs to, in addition to statutory requirements, there needs to be a very heavy duty educational campaign that is mandated on both the carriers and information providers to let consumers know the nature of the industry, but most specifically to know their refund rights. Because unless the consumers know their refund rights, um, there's no way they're going to be able to apply uh, for a refund or to give information in terms of complaints. 
Doc, doc, Dr. Goldberg, would you, would you like to comment on it? Because it seems to me that the problem that you have highlighted, the kind of consumer problem, uh, is exactly the reason why we need to have stronger refund uh, uh, procedures and stronger procedures to help victims. If you can hold up this money, as has gone on in the case that Ms. Albrecht uh, mentioned, as the case uh, that the Postal Service uh, mentioned to me, where MCI was taking a cut uh, of $165,000, seems to me consumers like yourself never get made whole. Is this question of, of refunds uh, uh, and restitution to victims uh, something you see in that fashion? Well, Congressman, I think the restitution issue may be useful in some of the types of scams in which a person feels they are buying services, an adult, for example. My concern, as I highlighted in my testimony, is those of us who have children feel that we can hardly leave the house alone with that telephone sitting there and a means of creating havoc in our financial situation. My solution as, as a parent is simply that I want to have the ability to block those numbers straight away and avoid the problem altogether. If I want those services, then I could use my credit card number or an access number as an adult. But with children at home, I think we must have a means of blocking those numbers altogether. Well, I, I certainly share that, uh, share that view as well. That, uh, that is not a, not a point uh, uh, in question. I think the name of the game is always uh, you know, prevention and, uh, and trying to uh, avoid the kind of situation where you're playing you know, catch-up ball. I just also want to make sure that when uh, somebody has been caught and, uh, in effect, uh, uh, found to uh, be violating the rules that consumers uh, get made whole, because I think that that uh, is also a very strong, uh, you know, uh, deterrent. Once you, once you start having to give people's money back, you tend to look at things in uh, a little bit different fashion in this country. If I may make one further comment, uh, it is very difficult for most people to begin contesting those bills. I suspect a great number will simply pay it out of fear. And there are a large number, I am sure, that are unreported and will remain so. Well, I think that's, that's true. Yes. I would just like to add, uh, Congressman Wyden, that I think you're correct to, uh, to focus on the uh, inner exchange carriers. Uh, it's sort of a funnel where you have dozens, hundreds of information service providers, all of them passing through this funnel of essentially four inner exchange carriers, and then back out through another funnel to, to perhaps hundreds of telephone companies. And if you can make the, the locus of the, uh, the, the dispute resolution procedure, uh, the inner exchange carriers, uh, I think you've uh, taken a, a positive step. Well, that, that's certainly the, the concern of a lot of the, the law enforcement uh, officials, that, that somehow uh, if Congress goes after the audio text people and the promoters and then uh, uh, gives short shrift to the problem of, uh, of the uh, role of the inter-exchange carriers, we'll, we'll just be back here in another year dealing with it all over again, and your point's well taken. Uh, uh, the subcommittee would also like to uh, ask uh, about the issue of uh, 900 service providers testifying uh, uh, as to uh, their fair and ethical practices and the good value that their services uh, represent. They've been weary that in the process of eliminating uh, bad apples that uh, uh, somehow Congress might unwittingly uh, penalize responsible uh, services. Uh, would each of you suggest uh, steps that uh, could be taken to make sure that responsible 900 service providers are not harmed in an effort to go after uh, uh, the bad apples? Why don't we start yeah. with you, uh, sure. Mr. Um, I think I sort of, I have been meeting with industry, industry representatives um, oh, for almost the last year. And I think that one of the things that's very important is I think that that type of dialogue continue so that the consumer advocates uh, and regulatory folks at the state and federal level who want strong legislation meet with industry representatives in terms of being able to craft a bill that one provides adequate consumer safeguards, but at the same time, um, you know, does not turn uh, both the good apples and the bad apples into sort of a sour tasting applesauce. Other comments? Uh, to make sure that the responsible are not deterred? Uh, we uh, have stated in our written testimony that 
uh, the industry has been very responsible in adopting standards. Uh, the Information Industry Association, the NAIS, uh, even the, some of the service providers and information providers um, have adopted standards and codes of, of conduct. Our problem with these is simply that they tend to be very weak, uh, very self-serving, and uh, also are entirely voluntary upon the industry. And we would suggest that as a further step to adopting standards of, of conduct, uh, for their members or for information providers and service bureaus that they make these uh, uh, standards mandatory upon people who belong to their organizations which belong to their associations. Uh, we feel that it's a fatal combination to have weak standards and voluntary standards and that the industry needs to do a good job of, of, of making Ms. Albrecht. It's sort of difficult for me to advocate uh on this level, I, it's. Uh, I assume my view of the of the of the of the legislation is that it does nothing to deter uh, the you know the good providers or whoever they are. I see nothing in it that would would have that effect. Very good. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gordon will be pleased to hear. <laughs> All right. Yes, it, I believe that the that the legislation uh, as drafted, especially to the extent that it uh, relies on giving uh, adequate and complete information, both through advertising, through preambles, uh, through notice, uh, uh, frankly, that that should uh, be beneficial to uh, to all providers, uh, and um, uh, certainly we'd be happy to hear from providers who, who have suggestions as to how to uh, to modify this. But in our view, the legislation itself is designed, as Congressman Gordon said, to uh, to weed out the problems rather than to uh, hurt the responsible providers. Dr. Goldberg. Well, I believe there are useful services that uh, provide uh, information, news, and as long as the um, uh, costs are, are clearly indicated uh, for those that wish to uh, access those services, uh, I, I see no uh, problem uh, with being upfront. Uh, I suspect those industries uh, see none. Hi there. Last, last question is just so we have, uh, have your organizations uh, on the record. Because of the uh, nature of, uh, of the voluntary standards and uh, the failure of any agency to get uh, on top of it, it is uh, the position of each of your organizations, as I understand it, that uh, Congress should move forward uh, with federal legislation at this time to, uh, to correct uh, a growing area of consumer uh, abuse. Is that correct, uh, Mr. McEldany? Uh, yes, and I would sort of amend that to, in the, to say that, that most specifically we believe, and I think that's the nature of the Gordon Bill at the present time, is that the FCC is where the, inf the primary focus of the enforcement uh, has to be. Okay. Mr. Barker. Uh, we agree, Mr. Chairman, and uh, support the bill. Okay. Ms. Albrecht. Of course, we support the bill. It's very important, and I'd like to, to, to t take just a second to say that the bill does not preempt uh, state law as well as does not preempt the state's ability to enforce stronger laws and to, to, uh, to, to enforce them. It would be a mistake to place all the burden on, on a federal agency, the state agencies uh, as well, uh, can assist in this matter. Well, let, let me just, uh, just state it is uh, certainly this committee's interest to try to complement the effort of the states and not preempt them, and I appreciate your making that point. Mr. Popowski. Yes, I would just agree completely that uh, we believe federal legislation is necessary and we are very gratified that the proposed legislation makes it clear that states are also uh, free to uh, enact complementary uh, legislation. Dr. Goldberg. Yes, Congressman, I think this is a essential federal role that uh, deals with a national problem. You all have been helpful. We will certainly be working with your organizations uh, and you all personally in the days ahead, and we thank you for your cooperation. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Our next panel, Mr. James R. Harold, Director, Information Access Services, Pacific Bell. Mr. George Vinal, Director, Regulatory and External Affairs, Telesphere. Mr. Thomas Pace, Chairman, Board of Directors, Information Industry Association. Mr. Howard Levin, Executive Vice President, Interactive Telemedia. And Mr. Bruce J. Fogel, Chairman, Phone Programs, Incorporated, New York, New York. So used to swearing all those witnesses. Casual. You just, it is it is so much easier, so isn't it? Much more casual. Issues I put happy with it. It was perfect. That's what Maddie was here for.
Maddie's witness. Why do we Who's stop? Maddie's witness? Maddie's witness is this guy right here. Do you want to wait a little so, bit? Yeah, we should wait a little bit. So why don't we go with that back to one, pace, two, eleven, three, final four. We get to the... Here we go. <laughs> Gentlemen, we we welcome you to uh, to the sub subcommittee. We'll make your prepared remarks a part of the record uh, in their entirety. If uh, in the interest of time, you could uh, summarize your views. That uh, that would be very helpful. And why don't we begin uh, with you, uh, Mr. Harold? Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, my specific purpose for being here today is to describe to you how we in California are dealing with the issues this subcommittee is now addressing. My name is Jim Harold. I'm director of California 9976 for Pacific Bell. In this position, I've been part of the team that developed and now manages Pacific Bell's interactive telephone service known as California 900. Pacific believes that the most important issue facing the 900 services industry today is the challenge of facilitating the growth of the industry while enabling consumers to make informed decisions. We feel strongly that consumers should be given information needed to make these decisions, and to that end, we support the establishment of uniform safeguards. We at Pacific are excited about the emerging 900 services industry. However, we learned some important lessons about consumer concerns from our years of 976 experience. As a result, before we introduced our California 900 service, we worked with the California Public Utility Commission, consumer groups such as Consumer Action, represented here today by Mr. Ken McEldowney, industry participants, and state legislators to craft effective safeguards intended to avoid problems. These safeguards are designed to give consumers more control over access to these services and more confidence in using them, and most importantly, to create a supportive business climate that allows information providers to prosper with fewer unauthorized calls and consumer complaints. My written testimony provides a detailed description of consumer safeguards in place for California 900 service. I'd like to highlight some of the key safeguards here. First, all programs are preceded by a message which informs callers, first, of the name of the program, second, that minors should seek parental permission, third, that minors should hang up if the call is adult in nature, fourth, of the cost of the call, and fifth, that the caller can hang up if they do not want to be charged. Charges for the call do not begin until the introductory message is complete and the caller has had sufficient time to decide whether to stay on the line. A total of 18 seconds is allowed, 15 seconds for the introductory message, and at a minimum of three seconds for the decision. Second, our safeguards include price limits, specifically, the information charges cannot exceed $5 for the first minute, $1 for subsequent minutes. The maximum price for the call is $20. Third, we have a residential high usage notification plan covering combined charges on California 900 and 976. Subscribers who incur charges exceeding $75 in a single billing cycle for the first time receive a notice informing them of the charges and directing them to contact their business office if they have questions. Low-income Lifeline subscribers receive a notice at a threshold of $30. Also as part of this high usage notification, Pacific attempts to personally contact a customer the first time that usage reaches $150 during any billing period. If we are unable to make contact, we temporarily block the customer's access to 900-976 services until we have made contact, inform the customer of the charges, discuss payment, and determine whether the customer wants to resume access. Fourth, Pacific offers a one-time adjustment policy to resident subscribers if it is established that, first, calls were made by the subscriber's minor children without parental consent, or, second, the calls were not authorized by the subscriber, or third, the subscriber was not aware that California 900 service charges applied. And last, among the safeguards that I'm highlighting, residential customers are offered free blocking of 900 and 976 services Blocking is also available to business customers for $15 per line. What has been the result? In one word, positive. There has been a significant reduction in customer complaints. 
Sales of our new programs are increasing and information providers using our service see the safeguards as positive and to their benefit. So we haven't killed the industry as some had challenged. Call volumes are increasing and this is in spite of the fact that callers do hang up during the introductory message. Also, calls are lasting longer. Even though calls are more expensive, adjustment rates are lower. I believe that all of these factors in combination indicate that callers who do stay on the line are making an informed decision to do so and are pleased to pay for the call. Lastly, we've received excellent feedback from consumer groups and many constructive questions from the media and key individuals in regulatory and legislative arenas. We believe that what we offer has been good for the consumer, good for the information provider, and good for the industry. On behalf of Pacific Bell, I wish to commend Chairman Markey, Representative Gordon, and others for beginning a national dialogue on the need for consumer <laughs> safeguards and for doing so in a balanced fashion that also recognizes the value and benefit that the industry provides consumers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am Thomas Pace, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Information Industry Association. I appreciate the opportunity to give IIA's perspectives on regulation of the audio text industry. Since its founding in 1968, IIA's membership has grown to include over 600 companies, including both entrepreneurs and established corporations that distribute information to the public through a wide range of communications media. A growing number of IIA members use voice processing technology to bring news, entertainment, and other information to millions of American homes via telephone. IIA recognizes that audio tech services are part of a much broader and more diverse American information industry, the strongest in the world. That industry has flourished on the First Amendment protections that restrain government regulation of information services. The same principles should apply as government considers how to curb abuses in the audio text industry. The information industry has a clear response to the problems you have heard about this morning. Fraud, deception, and sharp practices cannot be tolerated in the audio text arena. Not only do they hurt consumers, these tactics hurt legitimate audio text services as well. They tarnish the image of the medium, limit our growth prospects, and discourage the development of new markets and innovative services. They threaten the enormous potential of audio text as the great equalizer, the mechanism to deliver the benefits of the information age to virtually every home in America. During this morning's hearing, American consumers will place nearly 700,000 calls to paper call services across the country. The overwhelming majority will receive good value for, them, for their money. New 900 services debut almost every day. More and more Americans use these services to build their wealth, to protect their health, to participate in government, and share with the less fortunate, as well as to be informed, amused, and entertained. That's why we are so frustrated when a small minority of scam artists use this technology to defraud customers and hog the headlines in the process. IIA believes that all the interests represented here this morning, business, consumers, and government, have important roles to play in correcting the situation. The audio text industry must set high standards of business e ethics and live by them. IIA has taken the lead by issuing its standards of practice for voice information services. We submitted a draft of this to this subcommittee during its hearings last fall, and today I'm happy to re submit the revised text as approved by the IIA's board of directors this month. This culminates a two-year drafting process, but we know it is also a first step in describing the vision of what the audio text industry should be. Consumers must vote with their pocketbooks, supporting legitimate audio tech services and <coughs> shunning the frauds. That requires educated, demanding consumers, which is just what the information industry wants and needs. Consumer education is a top priority for our association and a key function of our standards of practice. Government, too, has an essential role to play. Most of these scams are plain, old-fashioned fraud committed through state-of-the-art means. Laws against these tactics are already in place so are agencies to enforce them. These agencies, federal and state, must have the tools and the resources to go after the crooks and hit them hard. Is any new legislation needed? Before Congress can answer that question, it needs to study how consumers are already protected by federal and state laws and regulations, and how industry participants are voluntarily adopting just the sorts of policies that would be mandated by new legislation. As it fills any regulatory gaps, Congress should seek to protect consumers while preserving the benefits of audio text to the consumer. Convenience, immediacy, ease of use, and low cost for most services. IIA commends Representative Gordon for stimulating debate on these issues by proposing H.R. 328. The bill contains many elements that should be features of the audio text marketplace 
and that will protect and inform consumers. Introduction of this legislation has already accelerated vol voluntary industry adoption of many of its safeguards. Other aspects of the bill are more troubling. The bill sweeps very broadly, far beyond 900 services or paper call services generally. Some of its solutions should be more sharply focused on the problems. A prime example is the requirement that every interstate audio text call include a kill message, an introduction that restates the program price and invites the call to hang up without incurring any charges. IIA fully supports clear upfront disclosure of the cost of audio text services. In fact, there are already strong incentives in place that penalize audio text providers who deceive callers about prices. Some IIA members, IIA member companies voluntarily use a preamble to remind callers of the price. But a blanket government imposed kill message requirement is much different. This requirement will drive up costs and drive down value for all consumers of audio text services. It will turn off some of the best audio text customers, callers who are looking for instant information, not a rote message that tells them nothing new. And it would set a troubling First Amendment precedent, sending the signal that use of new technology somehow justifies more intrusive government control of information content. There are more efficient and effective ways to inform the public about audio text costs than to make the government the script writer on every interstate audio text call. In conclusion, let me commend the subcommittee for holding these hearings. To realize the full potential of audio text, we need an educated public, a responsive industry, and a government ready, willing, and able to protect legitimate consumer interests. This morning's hearing helps bring all these objectives nearer. IA looks forward to working with the members of this subcommittee and with consumer representatives towards these common goals. I ask that my full written statement be included in the record and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pace. Um, our next witness, uh, again, Mr. Howard Levin, is Executive Vice President for Interactive Telemedia. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Can you move the microphone in closer? Certainly. Is that better? Mr. Chairman, members, guests, and panelists, I'm speaking on behalf of my company, Interactive Telemedia, and our trade, industry trade association, the National Association for Information Services. My oral and our individual written testimonies will demonstrate that we are working actively toward addressing the concerns raised by your committee last fall. Legitimate providers in this industry welcome regulation designed to curb abuses and would like to work with you to design rules that leave open opportunity for a full development of information services beneficial to consumers and businesses. Interactive Telemedia is one of the leading service bureaus in the 900 industry. As a full service service bureau, ITM offers both creative and technological assistance to a wide variety of information providers. ITM does not provide any adult programs, GAB, children's programs, or similar type of programs. The NAIS was formed by leading companies in the paper call industry who advocate self-regulation to create a positive business environment for legitimate paper call services. A formal comprehensive set of policies, the Code of Responsibility and Compliance Guidelines, has been adopted and is mandatory for all NAIS members. Individual written testimonies submitted to the, uh, by NAIS to the committee discusses these guidelines in greater detail. ITM and NAIS believe that self-regulation should be given a chance to work. However, ITM and NAIS support legislation provided it is narrowly focused and it is not broader than necessary to achieve the intended purpose. Our interest in cleaning up the industry is, of course, selfish. We want to create a positive business environment which will encourage continued, encourage continued development of informative and innovative 900 services. We want to create public awareness about 900 services so that informed consumers can use our services widely, wisely and be satisfied by them, thus stimulating continued growth and increased revenues in the industry. It is unfortunate that public policymakers tend to hear only the horror stories. Focusing solely on the abuses of 900 service is likely to result in a misapprehension of the reality in this industry. We are a society that wants instant information conveniently delivered. CNN has proven that by redefining the way we receive our news. In response to that consumer desire, information providers use 900 to offer a vast array of services. For example, the Wall Street Journal has been offering Gulf War updates via 900 services. Testimony presented today by various panelists include numerous examples of worthwhile 900 programming. I would simply urge you to keep in mind that a broad brush regulation will affect all such programs. We clearly share your concern over the unscrupulous service, provided the in, provide, uh, unscrupulous service providers in the industry. The NAIS code addresses many of these issues that you have raised. Very briefly, ITM and NAIS believe that price disclosure must be part of all advertising and promotion of 900 services, including telephone solicitations. 
That requirement forms the cornerstone of the NAIS code. The code addresses a number of concerns regarding 900 services directed at children. It sets out specific restrictions and also endorses the standards promulgated by the Children's Advertising Review Unit of the Council of the Better Business Bureaus. We support free blocking, but believe it should be optional rather than mandatory. Further, it is important for consumers to understand that at this time, due to current technology, blocking of 900 services eliminates access to all 900 services. In short, we, would agree, we agree with many of the provisions contained in the proposed legislation. However, ITM and NAIS believe that implementation of any regulatory effort must focus on the bad guys and not unduly burden the good guys, must pinpoint specific abusive practices and reflect remedies narrowly tailored to address such practices. Let me use my remaining minute to address a couple of issues that are of particular concern to ITM. My company is specifically interested in the regulatory approach taken to sweepstakes and contests. These promotional programs have long been used by numerous companies in corporate America as referenced by Congressman Gordon wanting to move 900 into the corporate environment. Magazines, direct mail, and television have used them, and they've used them to market products to consumers. To the extent that promotion is lawful, the media being used, in this case 900, should not be the issue. Another concern is our ability to pursue secondary collection efforts for charges which are legitimately due to IPs. Protection from unfair charges to consumers must be coupled with protection from unfair and abusive non-payment by consumers. Uncontrolled repetitive credits to callers have substantial negative impact on, an in on the industry participants and consequently limiting growth potential. We're a young industry with tremendous potential to serve the public conveniently and efficiently in this information and communications age. We should not be shackled with overly burdensome regulations inhibiting our ability to reach our most promising potential. We're facing a certain amount of hysteria today, but we urge you to work with us to benefit of the consumers and to the growth of the industry. Thank you. Mr. Levin, thank you uh, very much. Let's go now, I believe, uh, to you, uh, uh, Mr. Vinyl. Welcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is George Vinyl and I'm representing Telesphere Communications today. Thank you for this opportunity to, ad to address you concerning the enormous opportunities and unfortunate problems which have arisen from the rapidly expanding audio text industry. AT&T first introduced 900 services in 1982, followed by Telesphere's introduction of competitive services in 1978. Since then, the audio text industry has experienced an unparalleled growth. In 1990, gross revenues exceeded $500 million, and they're expected to exceed $1.2 billion in 1991. These figures are particularly encouraging in light of the current economic recession and the relative youth of the industry. While many parties in the telecommunications field are currently only anticipating their entry into the information age, 900 service providers are already there. Many Fortune 500 companies are experimenting with 900 service offerings, as well as national, political, religious, charitable, and philanthropic organizations. Examples of these varied uses of 900 technology are included in my written testimony. While many tangible benefits are beginning to emerge from audio tech services, so too have instances of deceptive, misleading, and abusive tactics. From the consumer panelists, you have heard alarming stories of unsuspecting callers caught in various unscrupulous 900 schemes. We agree that these are very serious concerns. As a company which has made a significant investment in the long-term future of 900 services, Telesphere has every incentive to see these abuses curtailed. It is quite clear that until such time as the 900 industry establishes a credible reputation, Many corporations with creative new service ideas will simply not risk the use of 900 services if consumers perceive their 900 promotions as seedy. And these are precisely the business applications Telesphere must continue to attract to continue a vigorous market growth. Moreover, dissatisfied callers are the industry's greatest threat. Not only will irate customers not pay their bills, complain to federal and state agencies, and alert the press, they will actively work to dissuade other consumers from using any 900 services. In addition, the increasing wariness of consumers towards 900 services is leading many to block 900 services from their telephones. 
This shrinks the entire base of callers. I would note that Telesphere fully supports this optional local telephone 900 blocking at no charge to the consumer. But put simply, my message today is we must curb these abuses without eliminating a vibrant new industry. Unfortunately, this task is very complex due to the highly technical nature of the telecommunications industry and the array of regulatory and administrative bodies which govern it. As I will explain, Telesphere believes that HR 328 specifically and legislation in general will not accomplish these goals. In our view, the expert agencies, namely the Federal Communications Commission and the Federal Trade Commission, as well as the state attorneys general, regulatory commissions and consumer protection offices already have the tools and incentives to correct these problems. At this time, Congress should continue its active oversight of these efforts and supplement the authorities of these agencies as necessary. Moreover, each of the four 900 long distance carriers now have required binding service contracts that contain many of the provisions of H.R. 328. I appreciate Mr. Wyden's concerns regarding the role of IXC carriers in this endeavor, and I believe that these efforts will prove to be successful given a chance for them to work. To appreciate fully our concern that expert agencies be allowed to develop careful rules, one must recognize the various elements of 900 telephone service as they work together in a complex technical environment. Today, at least four different types of companies are involved in the end-to-end -end provision of any 900 call, and each operates under different regulatory and business constraints. Advertising, promotion, information provision, data processing, transmission, billing, collection, and adjustment are all necessary yet independent components of 900 services and are generally performed by different industry segments. Mm -hmm. Thus, to be effective, the regulatory framework for 900 services must be tailored to apply to the particular industry segment which is positioned to correct the abusive activity. Overreaching or overbroad regulatory requirements will stifle innovation and chill the development of truly beneficial audio text programs. The FCC and the FTC are in the best position to investigate the technology and the industry structure and, produ and produce a regulatory regime which stops the unscrupulous practices without unduly restricting development of desirable programs and services. And I should note that these rules are not voluntary measures, but indeed statutory requirements. The proposed legislation on audio tech services being considered today by the subcommittee is premature and could serve to preclude development of legitimate and valuable 900 services. Accordingly, Telesphere respectfully urges Congress to refrain from enacting H.R. 328 pending the, prom the promulgation of FCC rules and evaluating the success of FTC efforts. I too appreciate and applaud the efforts of the FCC, as does Chairman Markey, in this endeavor. We believe that cooperative efforts between these agencies and the industry, rather than legislative rulemaking, will best resolve current problems and set the stage for a long-term industry growth. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Mr. Vinyl, we thank you. Mr. Vogel. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Wyden and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate you giving me time to uh, let you know phone program's views. We're one of many information providers in the pay-per-call business. Pay-per-call 900, pay-per-call 976 business. We do not, as has been uh, suggested, well, we're not one of the uh, information providers who deny or avoid the problems that exist in our industry. We propose to solve them in a way that protects consumers and permits an important industry to develop and flourish, to benefit those consumers. We do, in fact, see the necessity for a federal law. The problems in our industry are big-time fraud, and there have been many examples that have been shown to the committee today. We're also suffering from another problem, and that's a basic new industry growing pains problem. There's not enough consumer awareness. What I'm going to propose is a pay-per-call solution that has worked and can work. We call it the Michigan model. It's currently working in the state of Michigan, it's in the paper call business, 
and I think it will solve our 900 <coughs> problems. It's come about as a result of thorough and reasoned opinion from a lengthy evidenti evidentiary hearing. It's laboratory tested. It's a success. The points it includes and covers are prominent price, price disclosures in all ads, voice over price disclosures on television advertising directed to children, instructions for parental consent on ads for kids' programs, free blocking for 900 upon request, liberal refunds designed especially for subscribers who, whose kids call or are unaware of their charges. No disconnection of basic service for failure to pay your 900 bill. We believe that a combination of the Michigan model approach at the federal level and enforcement of criminal laws will predictably solve the pay per call problems. There are two important elements that we'd like to highlight. And that's the availability of consumer-initiated blocking, but as importantly, telco-initiated blocking. Some of my colleagues have outlined the need for the liberal adjustment policy, and are, we're in total agreement, as I outlined. But we also think there are consumers who, unfortunately, as few as they may be, are abusing the 900 services. And we think after giving them an adjustment twice, that their phones should be blocked and only Congress can get that done through the F FCC. You might note that I avo avoided any mention of a preamble, or as we in the industry refer to it, a kill message, in what we have found to be successful in Michigan. And the reason for it is because we don't feel we need it, and because it's proven to do just what its name is, and that's kill an industry. In conclusion, I think the promise of the information age can be met and that we can solve the problems in the 900 industry. We look forward to working with the subcommittee to do that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. I'll have some questions in a moment. Let's uh, begin with a gentleman from New Mexico. Chairman, I apologize for coming in late. Uh, I did hear uh, towards the end of Mr. Vinal's statement that we should let the FCC uh, act before we do anything. I'm kind of getting a bit tired of every witness that I ever hear from before the subcommittee make that suggestion. I think if that were followed, we probably should fold up as a congressional business, Mr. Chairman. So let me start out with that without tilting on the direction of my questions. Uh, Mr. Levin, in the forum on the 900 number in Dallas, I believe was on December 17, 1990, you stated as follows. In terms of restrictions on children's programs, certainly we're not sure that they should even exist. Now, does this statement accurately uh, capture the view of interactive telemedia re with regard to the programs being offered for children by information providers? In other words, are you saying that children have the same understanding of these 900 messages as adults? Is that no, it's in fact, in my written testimony and in and in subsequent statements, uh, we believe that children's programming not only should have uh, requirements of parental permission, but the uh, the indication there was that uh, children's programming should we should be very careful about putting caps, price caps on children's programs. We don't carry any today because we haven't found any children's programs we want to carry. Okay, let me say that up front so that we don't get off on the wrong track here. But having been in the technology field almost my entire professional life, I know you can't see over the technology horizon. And therefore, all I'm saying is let's not close out our options. So I'm not sure that unnecessary restrictions, there are ways to deal with it. There are value that will come along one day. I can't tell you today what they are. I keep hearing education. I haven't seen any I'm happy with yet. Now, do, you, do you have in, uh, children's programs? None whatsoever. Now, how do you deal with parental consent on something like this? How do you deal with parental consent? In the same way you deal with parental consent on going into a store and buying cigarettes or anything else. I mean, you put warnings up front. You put warnings up front. You tell people 
Uh, we don't put the programs up because we're not satisfied that there are programs out there that have any meaning to children. So I I'm on your side on this. Uh, Mr. Fogel, on the kill message, your testimony you state as follows. The kill message is, quote, an unwarranted intrusion into the expressional freedom of both providers and vendors. In no other medium in America does the government interpose its required statement on a speaker. Now, on this kill message, uh, could the billable time of a consumer's call begin after the message ends, instead of uh, consuming 20 seconds of the caller's time, increasing the cost of the call, as, as your testimony points? Uh, what, what if the kill, uh, kill message were limited to stating the cost of the call uh, plus anything else that you want to provide for consumers, uh, wouldn't that give you a greater sense of First Amendment adher adherence? I'm not sure I, I'm understanding. You mean at the, at the end of the program? Yeah. yeah. In other words, after the message ends, uh, come up with a kill message, the, the billable time. If it were after the message ends, uh, uh, um, forgive me, I'm confused, that, wouldn't that mean that they've already incurred the cost? No, I'm, I'm talking about the billing, when you start the billing. When you start charging for the call. The charging for the call, after as I understand message. it, in, in what, what we call the kill message is, uh, thank you for calling sports phone, brought to you by phone programs. The cost of this call will be 95 cents a minute. Um, and if you would like, you can hang up All right, and not be charged. When does the customer start paying for that? Right now, the customer would be, have the right to hang up and not pay unless they waited for the beginning of the message. Well, why, why don't you bill them until after the message ends? Until that pre preamble? Yeah. Uh, that hasn't been proposed. We would support that, unquestionably. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, it costs the, it, what's, what's on the table now, sir, is it will cost the information provider, if we were to do business with AT&T and a service bureau, probably between 15 to 25 cents to have the customer hear the message that I just described and then hang up. We would pay that money. And In other words, what if the cost of the call is 9 or $10? dollars you go ahead and do that? I, I think, uh, although in my testimony uh, I'm clearly opposed to a kill message, that there might very well be a price point whereby we would have to have the admonishment to the consuming public. Um, I, I think the chairman is, is going to tell me my time is finished. Let me tell you of a personal experience that I, I found quite annoying. and uh, In my message machine, uh, I had a, a call from somebody wanting to sell me real estate. This is after I just bought another house. And the message was incessant. It took about four, uh, four minutes, and it uh, literally wiped out any further message I can get in that recorder. This was a 900 call. Now, is this right? Absolutely not. So what, what do you want us to do? Just wait for the FCC to act? No, I, I, I forgive me, but uh, we support legislation by Congress. Well, maybe, Mr. Vinal, I should have asked you this. What what should we do? <clears throat> well, here, here's my the reason I made the statements about the FCC being the proper authority to act on this are really twofold. Number one, as you are, I'm sure are aware, the FCC has already announced the initiation of a rulemaking on this matter, and I believe that that rulemaking will be issued in a very short while probably uh, within a month. Um, second of all, it's our understanding, it's our belief that the FCC is probably the best equipped to deal with the technical considerations of this matter. The reason for that is in most 900 situations there are at least four providers involved in the transmission and billing of 900 call and each of those would be today are, are being dealt with under different regulatory constraints and as the bill today is currently written it is our belief that it is not correctly applying the proper measures, pr measures to the proper parties. But I do believe that the FCC and their rulemaking and their careful consideration of this matter will, will be able to straighten that out and to properly uh, have the correct sanctions and rules applied to the right parties. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll have 
we'll, will you recognize for another series? We'll, we'll Go have, ahead. We'll have another Mr. round. Let me uh, ask you some questions, Mr. Harold, just to see if we can get into <coughs> some of the, the numbers and the figures that, uh, that this industry is about. Now, it's generally understood that the carrier typically charges the information provider with both a permanent fee for the transmission of the message plus a billing and collection fee, which may be a percentage of the provider's gross receipts. How large a share of the provider's gross receipts are typically maintained by the carrier? Congressman Wyden, I can really only speak for California service. I understand the other services, but quite appropriately don't think I should speak for them. Um, in the case of California, we do charge an initial installation fee, and then we charge a per message to bill and a per minute to transport. We charge currently a nickel to bill the call on behalf of the information provider. We charge 20 cents for the first minute, 9 cents for subsequent minutes. M Mr. Vinyl, question to you. How large a share of the provider's gross receipts are typically maintained by the carrier? Um, I unfortunately uh, don't have knowledge to, to answer that. I really, I really don't know. Obviously, we provide the transmission capabilities. We do provide some of the billing uh, information. We package that information and provide it to the IXCs for billing. Um, we offer that as a service to the providers. This is a very competitive industry. Obviously, we compete against the other three largest uh, competitors in doing this, but I, I can't tell you precisely what that number is. Same question to you, Mr. Levin. I think uh, it depends upon the carrier, um, and, and that is it depend and if there's a service bureau involved and things of that sort. But typically speaking, uh, the published rates of the carriers uh, require that they take out uh, anywhere from 25 to 35 cents a minute for transport charges, uh, and that would include an initial minute charge for a billing and collection, which they uh, exact to cover the uh, LEC charges. So if your typical uh, information provider is charging a few dollars on average for a phone call, uh, in between there, if there's a service bureau, there's a service bureau charge. Uh, so you might see service bureaus charging anywhere from 50 to 75 cents a minute. So on a $2 call, an information provider would get a dollar and a half or so, and the IXC, the inter-exchange carrier, might get 30 cents on that minute, and the service bureau might get 30 cents for all their overhead. So that's an order of magnitude, but of course it varies as a function of the price of the call. Is, isn't it likely that if Congress just walked away from this, and, and Congress said we're not going to move the Gordon bill and we're just going to butt out, isn't it likely that if there was just industry self-regulation, some of the carriers would be reluctant to take action against an information provider since they share in the gross receipts of the companies? Start with you, Mr. Harrell. Again, I need to speak for California. I think that's the appropriate. No, but, but talk in terms of the concept. I mean, I, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to know your views uh, uh, because so many of you, and this is not true of all of you, I note that you, Mr. Vogel, have said you would support legislation, but by and large, the sentiment in the industry is either for Congress to, to butt out or, or to in some way step back and give the industry more time. And, and I would just like to know that uh, your views on this question of, uh, of self-regulation, whether some carriers would be reluctant to take action against providers because they share in the, uh, in the gross receipts. My oral statement indicated that, that a key element of the whole proper solution was an informed consumer, and I think that's point one what we're all trying to achieve here. The industry sounds simple, but I believe it's really very complex. It's evolving rapidly, and it's fast developing. So one thing we need to have in the long run is flexibility as we try to solve the problem. Self-regulation may now be too little too late. Now, what I've indicated in the way of California safeguards are extremely close to what's in the proposed bill. There's probably some compromise available around some of those various points, the specifics of how they would be dealt with. Um, Uh, the bottom why, line why, was... Why don't, why don't you try to answer the question? <clears throat> Isn't it unlikely that some companies under self-regulation would be unlikely to move against providers because they share in the gross receipts? I, mean, I, 
I'm asking it now for a third time because we, we would like your views on it and it seems to me you know, patently clear that that would be the case of some companies, not yours or anyone else, but, but certainly it would seem to me that some companies that have been involved in these practices would be uh, singularly reluctant to move because they share in the receipts. Isn't that correct? Yes, I believe that is correct. Okay. Mr. Vinyl? Yeah, I would like to say something on that point. Um, I understand your concern about self-regulation, and certainly we at the table have been, have been discussing these things and, and trying to impose the correct self-regulatory uh, schemes on themselves. There is, a, although, a large difference between a regulatory scheme that the FCC would impose and one that's self-regulatory. And what we have advocated is not self-regulation, but regulation being imposed by those expert agencies who are best equipped to provide non-discriminatory and fair rules and regulations to the industry so that the A, they're correctly applied, and B, they allow the industry to continue. Mr. Vinyl, a, a question uh, for you. You uh, state that uh, it would pre be premature and unwise for Congress to uh, move forward uh, on uh, uh, this legislation and uh, that the industry is, is moving rapidly uh, to deal with the problems. That's just not what the Postal Service inspectors are saying. And we're not talking about something they wrote six months ago. We're talking about something that was dated a couple of weeks ago. And I want to read you some of this. The Postal Service said carriers are not effectively screening 900 promotions. They permit obviously fraudulent ones to use their facilities. Even after they're put on notice that a particular scheme has run afoul, of consumer protection laws, they permitted virtually identical schemes to use their facilities. The Postal Service says the carriers fail to assist the consumer seeking redress. They just pass the buck uh, to the promoter. My question is, how can you say that uh, your company and other uh, of those who are the four large inter-exchange carriers are moving responsibly in this area when the Postal Service says you're sitting on your hands. Somebody's, somebody's uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, talking about a, a, different set of, uh, a different set of facts. And no, I, I, and absolutely. I definitely understand Postal that. Postal Service that wrong? Are they wrong? No, I, under, I, I clearly understand that concern. The reason that I say it's premature and the reason that I say it's rapidly moving forward is really threefold. Number one, as I've said before, the FCC has announced a rulemaking on this exact issue, and it's my understanding that that notice will be out within the next month. Clearly, the FCC is very involved in this issue. I, I know they've had meetings with the subcommittee regarding this very issues, and I, I think they, I know they plan to act on this. Number two, the FTC as well has begun a vigorous campaign of enforcement on the fraudulent providers of this service. I know our sub, my company, is one, has worked with them on a number of cases, have met with them on numerous occasions on this, on this topic, and I, I assume that uh, my other colleague, IXC, has done the same. And, and the third provision of this would be the internal service policies that the carriers have adopted. Um, <coughs> while it is true that it took a while for all of the, uh, the carriers to come around to the opinion that they needed to adopt these uh, policies, I believe that all four of the major carriers in around November, uh, December, the middle of December of this year, have adopted these uh, policies and make them binding service contracts of their, of their uh, um, service with the information providers. Now, on the other hand, of course, what you would be asking me to do is, is monitor every line, every minute of the day to make sure that fraudulent people are not on my lines. And to the extent that I uh, have, would have the manpower to do that, um, I would be, we, we try to do as much uh, of that as we can. It's not possible for us, of course, to do that. But to the extent that the FCC brings cases, consumers bring cases to us, and complaints are done, we, we deal with them in a speedy fashion. And I believe your colleague, Mr. Cooper, uh, can testify to the fact that he asked us the same question in the last hearing, and we provided him a list of those uh, companies which we either terminated or dealt with on our bureau as uh, not complying with our service rules. I'm going to ask Dr. Goldberg to come back up just for a moment because I uh, want to get for the record his experience with Telesphere specifically. If uh, the subcommittee staff can just get an uh, additional chair for uh, 
Dr. Uh, Dr. Goldberg, uh, and you've got to move that microphone to him, uh, Mr. Levin. Dr. Goldberg, let me ask you if this was the factual situation in your uh, situation. Your problems, as I understood them, uh, C&P initially said that they would forgive the charge, but the problem was then turned over to some kind of collection agency, and I'd like you because I want to have us uh, specifically uh, accurate on the facts to tell us what happened and what was the role of Telesphere, if any, in your situation. Yes, Congressman. As I understand from what I was told by the CNP uh, manager, that CNP could remove them from my local bill, but they could not guarantee that the long distance carrier, I believe, Telesphere, uh, would uh, not still make claim on that bill. And indeed, uh, as I indicated, I did receive subsequently, a month or so later, a, a collection agency action representing Telesphere uh, trying to make a uh, collection on those particular charges. Doctor, that is what we wanted to make sure we were uh, clear of. And uh, Mr. Vinyl, I think uh, that is just an example of uh, the kind of, you know, kind of concern I, uh, I've got. I mean, we've got the Postal Service saying that y'all are sitting on your hands. We've got Dr. Goldberg and our constituents coming in here and saying, for example, that uh, uh, local exchange carriers are interested in trying to work something out in the consumer's interest. And Dr. Goldberg just tells us that you all turned it over to uh, uh, collection operations. So uh, understand that we've got some real concerns here. It's one of the reasons why we, we feel we're going to have to move forward uh, with some uh, additional uh, legislation. I'm going to recognize my colleague from New Mexico, and I'll have uh, some further questions when he's done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Levin uh, and Mr. Fogel, these are, I think, brief answers, if you could. Both of you advocate in your testimony free consumer-initiated blocking on request. And my question is very simple. Who should absorb the cost for this blocking service, the consumer or the uh, local exchange carrier? Local exchange carrier. Local exchange carrier. Mr. Har Mr. Harrell? In Pacific, it's borne by the information provider. We do, in fact, levy a two cents per billable message charge and over time recover the company's cost of implementing blocking. Mr. Pace? I have a feeling, Mr. Richardson, that the, uh, ultimately that the consumer will end up paying for that by virtue of the tariffs and the information costs. I, I would believe the most equitable way to, to, um, to divide that cost would be to spread it across the access mm -hmm. service requirement for inter-exchange carriers. That means the consumer, right? It's, gonna, it's going to eventually go to the consumer one, one way or the other, be it through, in, in, eventually it's going to trickle down in some way. I believe through the access service requirement, it's the most equitable Why, way to What do about it. the consumer that doesn't use this? Why should he pay or she pay? Mr. Fogel? The, the fact of the matter is, and it was in a hearing in, in California that we were participants uh, of, that the cost from the central office to do this blocking uh, is very, very small. And if, if it can't currently be absorbed by the billing charges that are uh, served up to the information provider from the LEC to the IXC and ultimately to us, and they raised it to where it could be absorbed, that certainly would be satisfactory. But the price is almost negligible on, in, in hearings and on the record in California and in Michigan, and I suspect that would be the case across the country. Uh, be, while I have you, in your testimony you also stated, uh, Mr. Fogel, that there are only a few quick buck artists uh, in the industry constituting a small percentage of the pay for call industry. Could you provide that data that you have for the record? No, I, I don't have uh, any precise uh, Well, how, how do you know it's just a small percentage? Because the number of calls that are trade magazines and the number of dollars that are trade magazines. I mean, you heard the consumer advocates in the previous panel. They seem to think there's a sizable number. Well, well we've been hearing of the same uh, abuses 
in certain instances now for the last three or four years. We're not for a moment suggesting there are not abuses. We've asked the attorneys general to, to uh, give us the numbers. I know the IXCs have asked the attorneys general who are studying this to give us the numbers. Okay, so, but We're you hearing hundreds, right, not tens of thousands. You don't have any thousands. records of a small percentage being nefarious quick buck artists, correct? I personally don't. I have only from what we've read in, in the trade journals. Now, uh, is it Mr. Vinal or how should I say it? It's vinyl, I, actually. Vinyl. Mr. Vinyl. Telesphere uh, does or does not offer programming uh, that is, quote, obscene or sexually explicit. Well, Telesphere is a carrier, not an information provider. We, we carry for information providers. It is a term of our service policy that we will not carry obscene or objectionable okay. material. Okay. All right. That's what I wanted. Now, could you explain to members of the subcommittee w what would you describe as sexually explicit? How would you define obscene? Well, I think that's uh, I think that was best said by somebody who said, uh, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I know what it is when I hear it. But uh, I, the, the answer to that, that question is, when we turn an IP up on our program, we go through a screening requirement. And in that screening requirement, we view the content of the program as well as other, other, other factors that are involved in our service requirement. At that time, we make a determination on those providers as to whether we will carry the content of their programs or not. All right. Now, have you ever turned anybody down? Yes, we have. In fact, we provided a list to Congressman Cooper um, at the, after the last hearing regarding that, and I would be glad to send you a revised you, copy of that if you'd like it. W would you do that? Because it seems to me that you are now becoming the uh, First Amendment definer, and, and that's troublesome. Uh, do, do, you have, uh, do you have chat lines, those, the women that get up and say, call me, and do you have that I, I'm, in I, Telesphere? I'm not. I, I really don't have any knowledge as to whether we do or not. I know we do carry, or carry oh, what's on. called you, What do you mean line? you don't know? It's Specific to women, I, I really honestly don't I mean, know. Do you have I, chat lines? We do have gab lines, group access bridge lines. What we do, the way we, get, the way we do that, Congressman, is at the time the IP applies for service on our network, we decide at that point whether we should, based on the content of their program, keep it or not. Subsequent to that, we will then monitor and go back and review those lines looking for instances that would not meet our objection and by way of our contract we were able to terminate that provider from our now, from our service. Mr. Levin, you're a service provider. How do you monitor these issues that okay. uh, that that's a very good question. In um, in our organization, uh, as a service provider at ITM, uh, we have some very, very uh, specific requirements. We do a thorough script review. We don't put up any adults. So if we see adult content, if we see anything that is inordinately long or inordinately expensive, we just tell them, go to another service bureau. Um, we do a price review um, and some content assessment. If there are sweepstakes or in a contest, we insist on outside legal review. If there are cash prizes of any sort, we insist that they be put up as bonds and that they be registered in the appropriate states or we won't put them up. We have turned down people. We have turned away. Uh, you have turned. We have turned away down people. We have turned away things that you can get in the public uh, sector where people are charging in, or wanting to charge uh, high prices. So, I mean, that's, we, we have controls on that, and we monitor our calls constantly. Now, Mr. Pace, let me ask you a question that will allow you to become a statesman. I could you are a legitimate provider. Um, how do we balance the needs of uh, legitimate provider information to a consumer and uh, what is uh, legitimate for children and the consumer not be uh, improperly dealt with or ripped off or whatever? Uh, how would you suggest we balance this? Well, that's in terms of addressing this, the legislation that's before us, that was one of our major concerns was as a what we consider to be a, 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 an information provider with uh, some clear goals that are aimed at integrity. We, we're afraid that the statute is a little too broad in terms of the services that it tries to reach. Um, you know, under the definitional section, it's, it's, it includes in there things that would be considered subscription services. For example, we offer something called Dow Phone, to which uh, customers actually subscribe in advance, they have a contract, they have the information before them, before they sign up for the service. So 
some of these things dealing with the kill, the kill messages and, and the like that relate to financial news and other kind of programming really could work against the availability of those services. One of the reasons people call these kinds of services is the immediacy of the information. And what we try to do is balance the immediacy with accuracy in the advertising that gets the person the call in the first place. I think the emphasis needs to be with respect to the advertising that gets the person the call in the first place. Uh, the, if that is done correctly, then the need for kill messages and things online is reduced, if not eliminated. With respect to children, there are special considerations, and part of what the IIA standards of practice require are that they be treated specially, that the information is very clear in language that they will understand further requesting where appropriate that parental consent is obtained first. And we propose to work with the carriers so that what can be included with a bill, everyone's bill, that they receive every month is a clear list of things to look for in the provision of these services. Will you become a statesman? I don't know if you answered my question, but... Uh, <laughs> An evasive statesman. <laughs> uh, my last question, Mr. Chairman, to, to Mr. Levin. I, I, I guess you, you heard some of the consumer groups uh, listed a number of uh, direct mail and newspaper promoted 900 programs, and I just want to read you two of them and, and, and see if you think that, that these are appropriate, because you covered one of them in your answer to me. One... Uh, is your $2,500 credit limit has been approved. Postcard, 1-900-230-0001. Sprint provided the number. That was the first. The second, National Sweeps Award Notice. Postcard, 1-900-226-9300. MCI provided number. I mean, are those within your... Would you have accepted those? Not if that's all it said and that's all that was there. I'd have to see the advertising and the promotion because, and if that card was the piece, the piece would have to involve a product promotion. The piece would have to have a free alternate form of entry. The piece would have to have some very clear and conspicuous wording on what the odds were and But you wouldn't things accept of that sort. sweepstakes. Pure, pure sweepstakes for the sake of a sweepstake are always coupled with some sort of a product promotion because otherwise they're illegal. Mr. Chairman, you've been very generous in allowing me to exceed my time. Well, I thank uh, my colleague, and I think that's very helpful. I have only one uh, additional uh, question I want to ask, and that is about uh, uh, this matter of a program, uh, Mr. Fogel, that uh, you all had or, or it is reported that you had a program about uh, uh, called Call Popeye. Is that uh, something that you all had at one point? Yes. Okay. If a child called the number and heard part of the story, was he instructed to call back on another day to get the rest of the story? No. He was not? No. Okay. Uh, that uh, is all that, uh, that I, really, uh, I really had uh, for you, Mr. Uh, uh, Fogel. I think uh, you know that uh, the members have been concerned about that, and apparently a lot of our constituents uh, uh, had reported that uh, uh, I know that uh, the uh, chairman of the subcommittee wants to uh, come uh, come back, and he has uh, been been uh, required uh, away from uh, the subcommittee to uh, represent the full committee before the rules uh, uh, committee, and he is on his uh, on his way. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, of you, uh, uh, Mr. Vinyl. Uh, uh, the subcommittee is. Uh, aware of a number of cases in the industry where it's possible to say that a specific federal or state law has not been broken or where it has very carefully been circumvented. For instance, in a recent uh, case in Iowa, 80,000 people were enticed through a mailing to call a 900 number at $9.90 a call. It was a vacation extravaganza kind of arrangement, promised no airfare, no meals, no uh, additional expenses. <coughs> Lawyers uh, for the two men contend the mailing was legitimate because callers could have mailed a postcard instead of making the $9.90 call. 
The problem with these kind of abuses is that they skirt uh, existing statutes. They don't uh, break it. My question, uh, uh, this will be the last question I'll have for the panel, would be how could, uh, in your view, Mr. Vinyl, stronger enforcement of existing statutes <laughs> ameliorate uh, this kind of abuse and, and how could the industry uh, pursue uh, uh, approaches to root out uh, this kind of questionable advertising? Yes, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I really have, would have two, two responses to that. Number one, on a practical matter, companies such as Telesphere and the other IXCs, um, at least specifically talking about Telesphere, we reserve the right um, to review the content, as I have said before, about the programs and decide whether the programming is appropriate for our network and our goodwill, et cetera. In a case such as that, although I don't have the specific details more than what you've given me, uh, we, would, we would be able to make the determination that that type of programming would not be in our best interest and be able to terminate that caller. Um, the second response would be that it's certainly my understanding that the FTC uh, is empowered to prosecute cases where fraud has indeed occurred and to the extent that uh, they would need additional authority to go after these or any other type uh, schemes, I think it would be appropriate for the Congress to act to empower them to give them that whatever requisite authority would be needed. Okay. Well, I'm pleased to have had the opportunity to uh, ask this panel some questions and uh, the chairman of the subcommittee has returned. I, I can only, uh, only tell you, gentlemen, I'm, I'm not one who uh, uh, is convinced that uh, the magical uh, ways of the marketplace are going to uh, gonna address this. I think that the vast majority of people uh, in your industry are honest and they are trying to do uh, uh, their uh, business activities in a responsible way. But it is clear that there is a growing number of people who are going to skirt uh, the laws and engage in these flagrant uh, ripoffs uh, of the consumer and uh, the existing uh, uh, enforcement measures are not going to deal with it. So I, I for one, I'm going to try to toughen uh, the Gordon uh, legislation to specifically require, for example, such uh, steps as refunds uh, for uh, uh, the consumer and the victims of, uh, of these, uh, these violations. And I would uh, very much like to work with uh, all of your organizations to, uh, to try to do this in, uh, in, uh, in the most uh, responsible, uh, responsible fashion. I think that uh, it is very important to uh, uh, engage in the kind of preventive action which the Gordon legislation uh, focuses on, and we'd all uh, understand that uh, that heads off a lot of problems. But when you've got uh, people from the Texas Attorney General's office talking about these very large uh, 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 contracts and very large uh, instances uh, where hundreds of thousands of dollars involved, when you have the Iowa case where uh, uh, consumers are not getting uh, uh, getting made uh, made whole in terms of uh, of their uh, lost costs. We're going to have to have some direct uh, assistance to the victims of uh, of these frauds. And I would hope that you all would want to work with us because this would protect the vast majority of people in your business that uh, are honest and and, uh, and reputable. So I appreciate it and. Thank you in particular, Mr. Chairman, for uh, the chance uh, to pursue uh, this, uh, this issue. Thank you, um, Mr. Wyden, very much. Um, I apologize to the panel. Um, and by way of uh, explanation, um, this morning as well, the budgets of the committees of Congress are being debated uh, over in the House Administration Committee, the committee that has responsibility for it. And uh, Mr. Dingle, the full committee uh, chairman, and, and I uh, were there to fully represent the interests of the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance to ensure that we received the full allotment of resources which we would need to process legislation in this area and in uh, many other areas, including uh, uh, cable and uh, Wall Street. And, uh, Judge Green's modified final judgment over the next uh, couple of years. And so I apologize, but uh, uh, to some extent, uh, <clears throat> because there is so much going on in Congress, uh, many of these meetings overlap. Um, let me uh, wrap up the hearing by uh, asking this. 
um, there's a great deal of concern that many Americans have about the uh, unwanted intrusions into their homes, uh, the uh, misrepresentations which uh, are uh, characteristic of many participants in this uh, particular field, uh, while at the same time uh, we have to stipulate the real benefits which are there, uh, not only uh, potentially but, uh, but actually. Uh, and, uh, and in striking a balance, it will be important for us to understand what the industry thinks, bottom line, we should do in these areas. Where are the areas, one, two, three, that uh, each of you um, individually believe should be addressed? What has to be corrected? Where are the problems? Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is wrap up the hearing by giving each of you one minute uh, to respond to Mr. Goldberg, uh, the consumer who was concerned about himself and his family. How do we deal with his problems? And, uh, and what do we uh, put on the books or not put on the books that uh, will uh, ensure uh, that he won't have to worry in the long term about the problems that are out there in this marketplace. And I'll give each one of you a shot for one minute, very succinctly, please, to summarize a strategy that you think should be adopted. And uh, I'd appreciate each of your uh, individual thoughts on the subject. Let's begin with you, Mr. Fogel, uh, if you would. One minute. Well, certainly, uh, I would uh, propose uh, laser surgery uh, rather than, uh, than an atomic strike uh, by Congress by uh, getting a bill put forth that doesn't overregulate an industry that needs regulation. And uh, that bill, uh, as outlined in my testimony, should easily adopt something that has worked. And I keep saying something that has worked. Michigan uh, has a pay-per-call uh, bill uh, in the form of its tariff. It solved the problem of inordinate number of complaints disproportionate to the population of the state of Michigan. And uh, there's no reason that that couldn't work on a federal level. It does not contain a preamble slash kill message, and it does not contain a uh, telco um, uh, opportunity to block, which I think should be added. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Uh, Vinyl. Uh, yes, I would um, uh, reiterate the things that I've said in my testimony, which basically is, in my opinion, is the expert agencies which would have the best ability to promulgate the rules that could actually provide a substantive growth for this industry and a platform for which we can grow from. So clearly the FCC has authority over common carriers, both the local exchange carriers who are involved in the billing of, of this service, the inter-exchange carriers who carry it. Um, in addition, the FTC has authority over advertising, over the content of information <coughs> providers' programs and the ability to prosecute fraudulent providers. And I believe to the extent that they um, need to be enforced in their authority to provide their goals, we're all in favor of any legislation that would do that. We're not blanketly, oppo blanketly opposed to legislation. Our concern is that these agencies be given the proper time to develop those uh, needs that it has and the uh, rules that it has, and to see if it indeed needs uh, new authority given to it by Congress. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pace, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we believe, the IA believes, that it can be best done, or the problems can be best alleviated by a combination of industry action in terms of working with the consumers as well as government agencies and also legislation. Uh, first, we feel primarily it's an education factor, getting the information into the hands of the consumer so they understand what they should expect okay. by such means as being able to provide information through their phone bills so that they're aware of these practices and what to avoid and what to look for. Secondly, that there be accuracy and completeness in advertising. This is a question of, again, industry standards and where deceptive advertising is involved, appropriate enforcement by either the FTC or another appropriate agency. That they have, that the consumers have an easy means to resolve problems, such as 800 numbers, which would be entirely appropriate, we think. That they be provided credits with respect to initial problems that might arise and the opportunity for blocking when in fact the problem seems that's, that's the only way it can be resolved. 
And probably the most important feature, Mr. Chairman, is, is the ability to have effective enforcement of whatever laws are in place. And, and that, if anything, seems to be the major problem at this point. You can pass all the laws you want, but the question is who's going to enforce them and how effectively. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Pace. Mr. Harold. Mr. Chairman, we could you please use the microphone? Uh, we attempted to think this through. I believe we offer it, and I believe what Dr. Goldberg needs is blocking that he didn't have to pay for, but available if he requested it. Honest advertising out there in the first place that tells what the programs are and what they cost. And in the event that he did or didn't see that advertising, something on the front of a phone call that says what it will cost and that he can hang up if he doesn't want to be charged for the call. A notification process somewhere through the billing cycle so that he can be forewarned that high charges are in fact accruing. And someone try to reach him tell them of that fact, and if they can't reach him, <clears throat> block on his behalf for the time being. And then as the one fallback and adjustment at the tail end, mm -hmm. should that need to be the outcome, and his name not to be turned over to a collection agency at the end of that entire process. Thank you. Mr. Levin. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, uh, from an NAIS perspective, uh, it's important that uh, it's understood that the members of the NAIS uh, are responsible to their guidelines. And if those guidelines were adhered to by the membership, a lot of these problems would not exist, okay? Uh, but there could be notices put in the phone bills. I'm not going to repeat what other people have said, <coughs> where the NAIS has put out some documents which basically say if you're unsure about the service, don't call. If you're unsure about the content, don't call. If you feel you've been ripped off, get appropriate billing and credit collection assistance from the IXC. And if you chill, make sure your children get permission to call. Um, but I'd like to recommend something that is not part of this bill that would solve a lot of your problems, and this is not the forum for it, but I'll just bring it up and work with your committee people afterwards. Service bureaus are the mouth of the communications funnel in this process. The four carriers cannot possibly efficiently, with manpower, monitor everything that's going on. Uh, some sort of a service bureau certification program would be a wonderful way to control this. You've got two areas you're concerned with. One is fraud, and the other is repeat calls and repeat credits. The repeat calls and the repeat credits are driving everybody from Dr. Goldberg to the LEX and the IXCs <coughs> absolutely crazy. Those can be stopped by service bureaus, so the bills never, ever, ever hit the consumer's uh, charge. And the fraud issues are another subject. But there are, there's an area there through service bureau certification and procedures, and I know you're active in some of these other areas that haven't been part of the Gordon Bill, that can stop this right in its tracks at the service bureau level. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. I thank all of you. Let me just say this in uh, conclusion to this hearing. I appreciate <clears throat> the confidence which each of the witnesses on this last panel have in the free market. And that's a very natural perspective which you'd bring uh, given the businesses that you're in. But you have to understand the perspective of Congress. We don't pass legislation to deal with the activities of the best people in any industry. We pass it legislation to deal with uh, those who won't abide by industry guidelines, those that won't abide by community standards, and seem to defy the uh, attempts by industry groups, regardless of the area, uh, to have them conform to uh, standards on a voluntary basis. And that's our dilemma. Not that we want to enter into any particular field, but that we deal with the very real fact that human nature being what it is, this 5 percent or 10 percent who will always operate at the margin, regardless of the industry. And that's where government has to intervene because those 5 or 10 percent, whether it be in the cable industry or the SNL industry, can do terrible damage to the reputation of an industry generally and can also do terrible damage uh, to the American public at large. And so we would like to work with you uh, to move forward uh, to craft uh, legislation which makes sense, which doesn't intrude into the legitimate business activity, uh, which gives to the FCC the authority uh, which it uh, does need uh, so that it can take appropriate action uh, where necessary, uh, but also to avoid uh, unnecessary intrusion into legitimate business activity that can help the American economy. And I think that uh, if you are willing to work with us as we work with uh, Congressman Gordon 
we will be able to draft uh, legislation which will be able to meet those not mutually exclusive goals and to protect the legitimate business interests of the people who you um, are uh, speaking for here today. Clearly, the worst operators don't want to testify here. Uh, and we find it very difficult in any area uh, to have them testify before us. The worst cable operators won't come in here without a subpoena. And so the best come and testify, and there's no question we respect them, but uh, they don't represent what the problem is. The problem is that which won't come in here and won't submit itself to the societal norms. So we're going to try to do our best here, and uh, we're going to try to do our best to ensure that the concerns which uh, Dr. Goldberg and others uh, on the consumer panel uh, brought to us are dealt with, but your business interests are protected as well. And uh, in honor to uh, sample public opinion, uh, uh, to see how many people support the more regulation, we've set up a 900 number. Anyone who supports it can dial 1-900-REGULATE. And uh, we will, uh, it's, I'm only being facetious, but you can see how, if uh, you wanted to in almost any area, uh, after ginning up some interest with uh, some television coverage of a particular subject, have people immediately begin to respond for the, um, for the uh, private interest monetary benefit of, uh, of people who want to capitalize. We have to have some guidelines here that are governmentally uh, regulated, and in that way we'll put the proper fear into those who want to abuse. We want to work with you at the same time, Mr. Levin, Mr. Harold, Mr. Pace, um, uh, Mr. Vinyl, Mr. Fogel, and those the types of people you represent, and we want to work with you protect those consumer interests as well. I thank you all very much for your participation. We want to work with you, and uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. <clears throat> A note that the mayor of Washington, D.C., Sharon Pratt Dixon, spoke yesterday at the National Press Club on the occasion of her 100th day in office as the district mayor. We'll air her remarks on C-SPAN tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 3 p.m. on the West Coast. We'll take a break now for a look at the schedule, and then it's our evening call-in program this evening. Good evening.